to uh, agree to the recording. It should pop up on your screen. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. But you have to agree that you're um, allowing yourself to record, be recorded. And I'm going to um, now mute everyone. And Joyce, you'll have to unmute yourself. And um, hopefully you all know how to unmute yourself. If you don't, you go up to the little blue box. Well, you should just move your cursor around and in your picture, it'll say uh, unmute. Then you can ask a question, but keep yourself muted the entire time when Joy's presenting, unless you have a question or unless she's asking us to have some sort of discussion, you've got something to share. Um, or you can go down to the, if, if more likely it's down at the bottom and it'll say mute or stop video. There's some icons down there, just click unmute. So I'm going to mute everyone now and Joyce, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, um, let's, um, let me introduce myself and then um, I then we'll open with a word of prayer and then I'm going to share my screen with you. I'll be using PowerPoint today. Um, so I'm Joyce Lieberman. I'm um, the Synod Executive and Stated Clerk of the Synod of uh, South Atlantic, your Synod, all of Georgia, South Carolina and Georgia, 16 Presbyteries. Um, and uh, I've been here as your Synod Executive for about five years. Um, uh, I before that I was the director for constitutional interpretation um, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and 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 I have actually done COM presentations for the South Carolina Five in that old job. So it's you know it's like old home week. So um, I'm I'm glad to be with you this morning, and I'm um, grateful that you've all been willing to take a Saturday morning slopping into the afternoon. Um, to learn more about your uh, work and the service that you provide to the Presbytery is serving on the Committee on Ministry. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Holy and gracious God, in our time this day, would you open our hearts and our minds that we may learn together, that we may hear your voice for the church, that we may understand that all that we do, we do for um, your glory and for the church of Jesus Christ as we express it in the Presbyterian Church. Give us um, perseverance for the day, uh, give us opportunities to learn um, and to connect with one another. We pray this in Jesus name, amen. All right, hopefully you'll be able to see my PowerPoint. Can you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, it's there, yay. All right. Um, so again, as, as Gavin mentioned, as we go along, I would uh, encourage you, if you have questions, just to unmute yourself and uh, holler out, I have a question and we'll, and we'll pause and do that. I hope to spend um, at the end of each section that we're going to do, have you go into uh, uh, breakout groups with your presbytery uh, COM members and staff. Um, and I do have a some questions that I want you to engage in. However, you are also just free to, to talk about how what I have just covered um, affects your committee on ministry and the work that you do um, and, and maybe the ways that you do it different, better, worse. <laughs> um, anyway, so to have conversation about that. So today, what we're going to do is I have four sections. The first is uh, committee on ministry basics that we're going to kind of uh, go over. The second section will be uh, empty pulpits and pastoral transitions. The third, we're gonna talk about examinations um, that you as the Committee on Ministry do on behalf of the Presbytery. And the last, which we hope you will never have to use, but you need to be prepared to use, is dealing with conflict. We will plan to have a lunch break around noon. Um, I'm encouraging us to take a 30 minute lunch break um, so that we can um, move it along and uh, get out of here sooner this afternoon. So, all right. So some of you are brand new to COM work. And I will tell you that the very first time I served on a committee on ministry in the Presbytery, I was a little overwhelmed at the amount of responsibility and work the committee on ministry uh, had to do. 
Um, and it would, and I, by the time I was chairing the committee on ministry, I, it was also a little more overwhelming because now I had to make sure all the balls that were in the air um, were being taken care of. Um, so I know that this is going to be a bit of a data dump for some of you who are brand new. Um, and so I'm going to encourage you to rely upon your other more experienced COM members and your Presbytery staff um, to help you understand the ways, particular ways that your Presbytery does things. Um, and also um, to make sure, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, that you have the resources you need to be able to kind of find those answers for yourself and um, to be able to check them out. All right. So um, 10 years ago, our, our book of order actually had a particular section that actually named the Committee on Ministry and listed all the responsibilities um, that the Committee on Ministry had. And then we uh, went through a, a rewrite of our form of government and the new form of government that came out had this to say about the Committee on Ministry and, as, and also as uh, the Committee on Ministry. Absolutely nothing. And so um, Presbyteries felt uh, a little at odds. And so many Presbyteries um, just um, dis decided to just sort of co-opt what they'd always been doing and plop it into um, what they were currently doing that the Book of Order did not mandate. So, um, so while the Book of Order doesn't actually have a named Committee on Ministry or a Committee on Preparation for Ministry, each Presbytery is expected to develop and maintain mechanisms and processes to serve pastors as pastor and counselor to ministers of word and sacrament, commissioned pastors and certified educators of the Presbytery, to facilitate the relations between the Presbytery and its congregations, ministers, commissioned pastors, and certified educators, and to settle difficulties on behalf of the presbytery where possible, possible and expedient. Um, each presbytery shall, not may, shall develop and maintain mechanisms and processes to guide, nurture, and oversee the process of preparing to become a minister of word and sacrament. So this is the book of order basically giving presbyteries freedom to create the, the processes and the mechanisms that they need in their particular unique sit, situation to, to fulfill the work that the Committee on Ministry and the Committee on Preparation for Ministry had originally done. Um, so what has happened over the years is that presbytery mechanisms and processes have evolved. Um, generally, um, <laughs> To, and uh, addressing the needs, the culture, or even some of the whims or the particular um, problems that presbyteries have had. Um, and this is most likely spelled out in either your presbytery manual or even a separate committee on ministry manual. Um, so um, even, th even though the committee on ministry is not named in um, the book of order. A lot of presbyteries just continued that same name, committee on ministry um, or the committee on preparation for ministry. Um, and even though you may be called a committee on ministry, um, sometimes uh, there's been a little overlap and uh, cooperation between the committee on ministry and the committee on preparation for ministry as they do their work together. Um, that's also spelled out in, in manuals and how to do that. And also sometimes you are actually engaging in um, work that is actually being done by you on behalf of the presbytery and you, uh, which, it, which is allowed in the book of order. So instead of everything having to come to the floor of presbytery, the presbytery can delegate to you as whatever you're called, the committee on, I'm gonna use COM just for uh, this uh, presentation. Um, the, you may actually have some um, authority given to you by the presbytery to do particular tasks. Um, so uh, that's really what the presbytery does in creating you um, to do that work. Um, so it is important for you to know in your particular situation um, what has been designated 
to you to do on behalf of the presbytery to actually make those decisions and what is still expected to come to the floor of presbytery for them to decide generally at your recommendation. So keep, keep that in mind when you're, um, be, when you're trying to understand your work. The book of order actually says that a committee um, is, is created to study and recommend action or carry out decisions that are made by a council. And, um, but the recommendations themselves require um, action of the presbytery. Now, the, the thing that presbyteries have discovered, especially, well, maybe even, even pre-COVID, was that when presbyteries were only meeting three times a year, that if they expected everything that's in, outlined in the Book of Order to come to the presbytery meeting, that is not very expedient or efficient. Um, and so um, instead of just saying, you COM just bring everything to us and we will approve it on the floor of Presbytery. They have said to the COMs, you actually get to make these decisions. So um, this is where the commission authority comes in that is granted by the Book of Order, where commissions are empowered to consider and conduct matters referred to it by the council, um, either through your manual of operations, the, you know, what, what has been adopted by the Presbytery, um, or uh, through an actual action of the council. And, but they have to state specifically what the scope of those commission powers are. So this would be things like, um, most commonly I see this for the Committee on Ministry where the Committee on Ministry has the authority to receive ministers coming from other presbyteries, um, to do the examination, to uh, vote to receive them, to approve their terms of call, to dismiss uh, minister, member, minister members to other presbyteries, kind of the, the normal routine, non-controversial things. However, I will tell you, there are some presbyteries that have been unwilling to let a committee make um, the decision and to receive ministers. And so they have still maintained that they must be examined um, on the floor of presbytery. Um, if you have commission authority to, if, as a commission, if you've been given authority by the presbytery to do some of that work, it must be reported to the, the council at their next meeting. So there should always be in your presbytery packet. If you're, um, this is what the commission on ministry or committee on ministry has done in this, since this last meeting on your behalf. Um, and, uh, um, and it is the actions that you take are considered to be the actions of the presbytery itself. Okay, any questions about that? All right. So even though the committee on ministry is not specifically mentioned in the book of order, the tasks that were assigned to the committee on ministry are. So pres presbytery still has the responsibility um, to be the pastor, counselor, and advisor to teaching elders and congregations. Um, the first responsibility under this section is that presbyteries shall be open at all times to communication regarding the life and ministry of their congregations, which is a nice, warm, fuzzy, large statement. The big question is actually, how do people in the presbytery know how to contact you and who to contact. If you really are gonna be open to the communication from your, um, uh, the, from your congregations, it's a two-way street. So uh, you need to be aware, how are you making sure that congregation the sessions and the congregation members have ac access to your ear um, and, and can share that with you. In the context of, um, these this responsibility of the presbytery there are three specific roles that are almost always given to the committee on ministry in a presbytery the first is um the the pastor and counselor so um the committee on ministry ordinarily serves as pastor and counselor to ministers of word and sacrament commissioned pastors and certified christian educators of the presbytery the second one is that they are a facilitator. 
um, presbytery is to facilitate the relations between the presbytery and its congregations, ministers of word and sacrament, commissioned pastors, and certified educators. And then the third one is to be the, the settler, I call it, to settle difficulties on behalf of the presbytery where possible and expedient. Um, I, you could use arbit, arbitrator, mediator, referee, yeah, whatever, however you want to call it. So we're going to look at these a little bit in, in more detail. So the pastor um, and counselor to the presbytery and, and to the ministers and Christian educators um, and uh, commission ruling elders. Okay, so we're going to spend, we'll probably talk a little more about ministers of word of sacrament in a little more detail in a bit, but um, commission ruling elders are work under the supervision of the presbytery. That is oftentimes given to you. Some presbyteries actually have CRE separate committees, but um, a lot of times it is given to the committee on ministry to oversee their, their work. Um, and in commission ruling elders have a minister of word and sacrament who's been assigned to them as a mentor and supervisor. And um, the, you would be undoubtedly involved in with a congregation as they're considering um, using a commission ruling elder to serve in their congregation. So you have um, a, a big role in um, being the pastor and counselor to and with uh, commission ruling elders. Certified Christian educators, um, I, you have a responsibility, which include, I mean, you probably don't know this, but um, that includes establishing minimum compensations and benefit standards for uh, certified Christian educators. Some of your presbyteries may not even have certified Christian educators serving in congregations, but um, there's, you are expected to have those minimum compensation standards. The certified Christian educators in the presbytery have access to you. Um, well, they have access to the, the part of the presbytery that oversees ministry. That's you. So um, again, how do, how do Christian educators know to get in touch with you, that you are available to them? Um, that are you even aware of what's who the certified Christian educators are in uh, in your presbytery? Um, so just to know, we're not just talking about ministers, even though that becomes such a big part of the work. Oftentimes, um, certainly Christian educators can get uh, left behind and to, to a lesser extent, commission ruling elders. Okay, we're going to talk about ministers of word and sacrament. So Presbytery has a responsibility, thus you, um, in examining, receiving, installing, removing, disciplining, and dismissing their, their ministers of word and sacrament of the Presbytery. Um, we're gonna spend a little more time talking later about examinations. Um, receiving means getting ministers of word and sacrament who are coming in to serve in your Presbytery or they're moving there to retire. Um, that and want to join the presbytery, so receiving them from another presbytery, installing them in in when the, they've been called and in, to a, a a called position, a pastoral position in your presbytery, and you uh, you have a responsibility to get them installed, finding the administrative commission to do that. Um, removing this is um, dissolving the pastoral relationship. No, it, this it, removing doesn't sound quite as <laughs> Sounds a little more harsh, but it's it's the 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 normal process of pastors move on to another call, um, or if it we're going to talk a little later about if it kind of falls apart and, and has to be somebody needs to move on, um, but it's really the, the the dissolving of the pastoral relationship. Disciplining is um, there are informal ways and formal ways. You as COM are not yet normally part of the formal ways, but you can be part of the informal ways. Um, not everything needs to. Let's let's say you have a pastor who um, is discovered has a drinking problem. You don't need to run, excuse me, rush to discipline. What you need to do is provide some pastoral care, but you also probably have some issues about. Um, 
you're going to have to get them into treatment. You're going to have to help them repair the breach that has or the, uh, that has happened in the congregation. So there are some things that you're going to have a role a role in. And then dismissing is the simple thing of transferring someone to another presbytery or another even another denomination. All right, all ministers of word and sacrament are members of the presbytery. And they are one of three. So every minister of your presbytery, you should be able to look at and say, they are one of these three things. There is technically a fourth, but it's not used very often. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The first is engaged in validated ministry. This is the biggest, well, I was gonna say, this is the biggest chunk you have, but I was in the Santa Fe Presbytery and we had more um, retired ministers than we had um, those in validated ministries, but this, this is predominantly your parish pastors um, and, and others that the presbytery has actually validated their ministries that are apart from uh, parish work. Then there's the member at large. Um, and uh, this is, and we're gonna talk a little more, more about that in, in a bit, and then honorably retired. So everybody should be, ministers of word and sacrament should be able to, able to tell you what they are. You should be able to know what they are. Um, so we're gonna talk in these in more detail. So the book of order is, has a whole long list, which is very helpful to you as a committee on ministry. If somebody comes to you and says, I want you to validate my ministry as the dog catcher um, for my county, um, that you can pull out and help inform you in the work um, th that to determine whether or not this meets the criteria of being a validated ministry. Um, so the validated ministry has to um, demonstrate conformity with the mission of God's people in the world as set forth in scripture the confessions and the book of order. It must serve and aid others and enable the ministry of others. It must give evidence of theologically informed fidelity to God's word. It must be carried out in accountability for its character and conduct to the presbytery in addition to any organize, organizations, agencies, and institutions served. Um, I know a presbytery that is very clear. If there is not a mechanism um, in, in where like a board or a personnel committee that oversees somebody's ministry, um, that they said this, th there is no accountability there and, um, and, won't, and wouldn't validate that ministry. Um, it must uh, include responsible participation in the deliberations, worship, and work of the presbytery and in the life of a congregation of this church or a church in correspondence with the Presbyterian Church USA. This is especially important uh, for, for Committee on Ministry to find out um, from those who are serving in non-pastoral positions. You know, do they come to presbytery meeting? Are they? Do they come to installations? Do they come? Um, do, are, are they worshiping? What's their congregation that they worship regularly in? Now, when ministers um, of word and sacrament um, are called to ministries beyond our church, um, this would be things like chaplaincies or um, being the synod executive um, and stated clerk. Um, they have to, we have to give evidence to the quality of life that helps share the ministry of the good news. So there's got to be some sense that, um, that there's gospel work going on here. Um, they uh, have to participate in a congregation in the, um, in the presbytery and ecumenical relationships. And, and certainly shall be eligible for election to higher council positions um, in the church and any boards and agencies uh, of the presbytery. And it, this has to be reviewed annually. I have, in, I'm a member of St. Augustine Presbytery and I'm expected to fill out um, 
their form every year and uh, return it to the committee on ministry then who looks through that and then validates my ministry again each each year. For members at large, uh, this is a, a minister of oh, Word and Sacrament who has previously been engaged in validated ministry, um, but who through no intentional abandonment of, the, of ministry itself is no longer engaged in validated ministry. Um, they can be um, uh, designated as a member um, because of a particular situation in their life, such as family responsibility of circumstances. Um, I've seen this particularly with trailing spouses in clergy couples, um, where a um, member at large has been granted to them because there hasn't been a ministry opportunity for this person to engage in while the other person has a called position. Um, and, and I've also seen this used for people who have um, things um, such as caring for dependents, elderly um, um, relatives, children, um, and it's up to the presbytery to determine um, whether that meets their requirements. Um, they are expected, members at large, are expected to comply with as much of the criteria that we just talked about, um, a validated ministry as possible. Um, in whatever it is they're they're doing, and um, certainly they're ex expected to participate in the life of a congregation, and um, they again also have to be reviewed annually um, by the presbytery. So um, you have a, you have a responsibility to to follow up with these people so they don't just sort of fall off the face of the earth and you never hear from them again. Um, so. Um, keep, you should always, always know who your, your role of ministers are and what their, what their membership status is and what they're currently doing and where you, where you have a responsibility is COM to um, follow up with them, either through the annual review or, or whatever else. And then honorably retired folks. Um, this is generally related to age when, when ministers of word and sacrament have decided that they are no longer um, going to be actively seeking a call uh, any longer and are not, you know, the, a lot of retired ministers do pulpit supply or might do an interim or whatever, but, um, but they've made the commitment um, and requested the presbytery make them honorably retired. It is also available to those ministers and um, who we would say, well, they aren't old enough to retire, but because of uh, physical or mental disability, um, they too have been uh, determined to be um, honorably retired. All right, those are the three categories of membership. Everybody's in one of those. Uh, to Joyce, a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, with regard to honorably retired and also member at large, uh, they are able to um, participate fully, uh, voice, vote, serve on commissions, et cetera. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. Then there are, minister let's talk about ministers of word and sacrament um, and pastoral relationships. So um, in, in the book of order, there are really just two kinds of pastoral relationships. In, uh, the, the installed, the call, we call that the called and installed. These are the folks that follow the more traditional route of being called by, you know, PNC, called by a congregation um, to come and serve, are installed um, in that position. And it can be for an indefinite period. That's kind of the, the, the norm for installed positions, but it could also be for a designated term. This, we used to have an old in the old book of order, the designated pastor, which was really was a designated term. So that is an option that, ch that churches have. This is sometimes used when um, the, the financial viability of a congregation is maybe a little iffy. So you might say, well, we're gonna see how it goes for a period of two years or three years, um, or maybe there had been uh, some history of some conflict and 
um, you're not sure how that's going to pan out. So you might say, well, let's 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 give it a test run. <laughs> we used to call them designated pastor in the office of the general. We'd say taking your pastor for a test ride. Um, it you know, it's like if if it doesn't work out after a couple of years, everybody departs. Otherwise, it can also the designated terms can also be turned into indefinite terms. Um, the the issue here is to make sure that you you're doing an open search. We'll talk more about that when we get to talking about calling pastors. Um, and um, but that's up to to you all as a, as the committee on ministry um, and the presbytery to talk about how you want to do that, if you want to do that. And then there are temporary pastoral relationships. These you can call them anything you want. Um, stated supplies, interims, transitionals, um, even evangelical outreach coordinator. Um, it's really up to you, but these are, these are um, pastoral positions that are not called by the congregation. No um, pastor nominating committee has been elected, um, but these are um, uh, kind of called, I, I hate to say hired, because really they're, this is all call, it's just different semantics. Um, they're, they're called like by the session to, to do transitional work for a congregation, or they're called by the presbytery to do transitional work for the, for the presbytery, or um, they're going to be the temporary um, associate pastor while the church looks for a uh, head of staff. So um, that's uh, those have those temporary pastoral relationships also have to be evaluated every year. Um, is it still in force and effect? Is it still doing the ministry well? Is this still the right direction um, that we should all go? I I know you know stated so I know stated supplies who've served the same church for twenty years. So just saying. Um, and now I, want, now I want to talk about this rule. <laughs> there is a rule in the Book of Order that associate pastors or temporary pastors are ordinarily, don't you love that wiggle room word? Ordinarily not eligible to serve as the next installed pastor. This used to be a hard and fast rule. Um, and then a few years ago, we changed it. But there is, there is a way for exceptions. Um, the mission strategy permits it. That means you, you as the presbytery can determine that the mission strategy of a particular congregation um, uh, per, would permit um, this particular person to be eligible to be considered to serve as the next installed pastor. This has to be by a three quarters vote of presbytery, not the committee, not COM, presbytery. And um, as a presbyter and somebody who believes that that's a rule for a reason, um, you better convince me that you have, you can explain to me what the mission strategy is that made you, you as the committee on ministry bring this to the floor of Presbytery so that this associate pastor can become the next called and installed pastor or this interim pastor can become the next called and installed presbytery, uh, pastor. Um, so this is, and I will tell you, <laughs> and the, the, this is the, pro the problem with this rule is when a presbytery does this once, it now becomes the rule. Oh, look, you allow this, but I'm trying to encourage presbyteries, um, especially committee on ministry, the bar is high for this. You have to think this through. Would it really be detrimental to the mission and ministry of a particular congregation for the interim pastor to not be the called and installed? So, um, and, and I will then tell you also the flip side of that is um, when pastors who uh, have applied for the position then find out that the associate pastor or the interim pastor 
is called to be the next called and installed, it feels a little disingenuous to them. Like, you know, why am I putting myself out there? Was this, did they just go through the motions? Did they honestly do an open and thorough search um, that, that led them to want to call the next um, pastor as someone who's already been there? It's, it's um, use this judiciously and wisely when you use it. Hey, Joyce, it's Robin. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I understand this, but I just want to ask the question about designated pastors. They're not in this framework, correct? No, because they're already installed. Okay, thank you. Right. And Joyce, let me uh, share one of the one of the reasons why we have this uh, ordinarily not eligible is uh, because as a long time interim, we don't want the interim going in there uh, thinking that they can schmooze and you know uh, get the get the call. the The second thing is for associates is. Um, you know, there could be some, it's allowed, you know, but ordinarily not eligible because they could undermine the pastor. They could set something up. And I, I, um, uh, I've heard of that. I don't know anything firsthand, but I do know firsthand that the associate was not undermining the pastor, but the associate spouse was. So. Right. Well, and, that, and you bring up a good point about the transitional work. The expectation for transitional pastors, interim pastors, is that there is particular work that they are called to do in, in the life of this congregation. And um, if they are working to be loved and adored so that they can keep the job because they don't want to move again, they aren't necessarily doing some of the hard work that they're being called to do. So... Again, sure. yeah. This is Olivia. Also, is there you've got the dynamic of a senior pastor kind of handpicking an associate to follow them? Yeah, we're going to talk about that okay. later. Yeah, we're does, yeah, like does that work? Okay. Um. So so that's those are you know just your garden variety ministers of Word and Sacrament who are PCUSA. Okay in pastoral relationships. Um, we also um, have the ability uh, to bring in ministers uh, from other denominations. Um, so ministers from other denominations who want to become PCUSA pastors. I know New Harmony is working on that with one of their pastors. Um, is uh, There is a process. So they have to have been called to work under the presbytery's jurisdiction. So they have to have been called to a church that you have the authority over. They can't just come to you and say, um, I'm a Methodist pastor and want to become a uh, Presbyterian. I mean, they could, but the expectation is, is that there's a call for, that they're being called um, to serve. They must present uh, credentials and evidence of good standing with uh, where their current denomination is. I will tell you how, how um, flimsy sometimes presbyteries are in finding that out. Um, that they take it from the person's mouth. Oh, I'm a minister of good standing in the Methodist church here. And they go, okay. Um, you have to do your due diligence. You need to call their um, bishop. You need to find where their um, uh, current uh, ordination and uh, uh, jurisdiction lies. And you need to talk to somebody in charge. Not maybe you personally, but somebody from, usually it's going to be your presbytery staff that's going to follow up with that. To provide Wouldn't that. it be good, Joyce, to have something in writing? Absolutely. Something in writing that the that Bishop Smith said this, or if there was some paperwork that they wanted the, the other denomination wanted to send you about them. 
it just, you know, even like we would send from the clerk of session or clerk of Presbytery that Joyce Lieberman is a minister in good standing in the Presbyterian Church USA and a member of St. Augustine Presbytery. Something signed by somebody in in um, in authority. Yeah. Okay. They must possess the qualifications of character and scholarship we, we, we require of our candidates for ministry, which you can find in our book of order. One of the things I love best about that is I think honest repute is one of the first things in there. Not that any of ministers would ever lie, but I do know of ministers of other denominations who have lied and gotten themselves into the, into the PCUSA. Again, back to the credentials and evidence of good standing. If in fact they meet all those requirements, and oh, let me let me also say, you don't have to hurry on this. You do you take the time you need to ascertain this. If this person has already been called as a Methodist or a ELCA or UCC pastor to serve in one of our our churches and is doing so as a temporary member, um, great. You can take there's that's nothing's going to change that continuing relationship, uh, but so you take the time you need to ascertain that this is um, that you're you're ready to to have this person come in and that this person really wants to be a Presbyterian minister and can answer all of the ordination questions in the affirmative, and you know you know because you've answered, you've all answered them. There's a lot of those. Um, so we will recognize their ordination. We do not reordain. Um, and when so, and so we will ask them the ordination questions, and then they affirm them all, and we enroll them. Now, the best thing about the current book of order in the hard copy form is that the, that's kind of this section. And then on the next page, there's one little sentence that people forget. Upon enrollment. They must furnish evidence of having surrendered membership in any and all other Christian churches. They have to they have to get a letter from their bishop that says you're not a Methodist pastor anymore and provide it to you. Um, I will say this is where some of our ministers have balked because they'd like to hold membership in several denominations. We. Um, when you're a PCUSA minister, you are a PCUSA minister only. We, we don't let ministers also be ELCA pastors. They can serve an ELCA church. But um, we expect one ordination. In Joyce, what exactly does upon enrollment mean? So they get examined by the presbytery. Um, uh, they, they sustain the examination. Uh, if there's any requirements that are waived, that's then the next vote by two thirds. Right. Then there's actually a vote then to receive them as a member. Right. And then there's the ordination questions and and and, and, a, and prayer. I would hope. I would think. But and then, what does the upon enrollment? So is that before the stated clerk? Con, uh, goes on no. uh, e ministry. The, yeah, they're enrolled right okay. then when they've done all that. They're enrolled. They're a PCUSA minister, but they then need to find furnish this evidence. Chris okay, so Valerius in the office of the General Assembly will tell you it ain't done till she gets that. Okay, I see. So, I see. Yeah. Right, but it's still that day, even though right. the minister, more likely, you know, because we never quit a job before we had, well, ordinarily. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so they, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, if you're a minister of another denomination um, who is uh, from another Reformed church, and if you're in doubt about what the Reformed churches are, there's actually a whole list on the PCUSA website, or you can ask. Um, People, it, it, these are our brothers and sisters in the Reformed faith. Um, so, if if that minister has been ordained five or more years, you may grant them an exemption from any or all of the ordination exams by a two thirds vote of presbytery. Now, 
you don't have to. You may. You may say, well, we just want you to take the polity exam. We're okay. But you're probably not going to be able to come to this decision until you have examined them pretty thoroughly and understand what their understanding is of who we are as Presbyterians, do they, um, their theology, worship, all of the sacraments, all of that. You're going to want to make sure that, again, they meet the requirements that we have from our candidates. So, um, and if you think this person is above and beyond and, you know, you can, you as the COM could recommend that this person be exempted from, let's say all of the um, standard ordination exams, but it would require a two thirds vote of the presbytery. Again, of the presbytery, not of you all, not of the committee. Um, okay, and that's just, that's unique to them. I, I will tell you, you get in, well, let me do this next one and then I'm gonna tell you we're gonna get in, in muddy water. Um, ministers of other denominations who are um, for, Im for immigrant fellowships. Presbyteries doing new church developments with immigrant um, communities oftentimes are seeking um, pastors who can serve these immigrant communities. Um, and sometimes the immigrant um, pastors do not meet our, uh, mostly our educational requirements. Um, so you can still receive them as a me member of um, the PCUSA, make them PCUSA, um, but you also have a responsibility to provide educational opportunities that uh, would are necessary and prudent for that minister's successful ministry um, as you bring them in. Okay. Where, where Presbyterians get in trouble when somebody comes to you and, and they're, um, a, um, they're a Baptist um, and wants to become PCUSA. Baptists uh, or, or some are non-denominational. There is no um, denomination-wide um, place or bishop or that you can go to, because those are generally congregationally based ordinations. Um, so you're gonna have to um, uh, walk a wisdom line here about what you wanna do. Now, <laughs> I, yeah, okay, presbyteries can waive every requirement for ordination Is it by a three-quarter vote, two-thirds vote? Anyway, two -thirds. By, a by, two -thirds. A significant, by a significant vote, except for ordination exams. So if, if you're a little uncertain about somebody's ordination and uh, but yet feel like this person would be a great PCUSA minister, that's when I encourage you to get advice from the Office of the General Assembly uh, about how best to do this. I have actually seen two presbyteries for very complicated reasons um, use this um, waiving everything except the ordination exams um, by uh, to allow that person to get order. That means you don't make them be a candidate or an inquirer. You, you don't need make them be a church member of a congregation for six months. You don't um, don't make them um, um, well, whatever you know. Anyway, so so it, 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 there is a possibility. My question to COMs is also: so you really need this person? I mean, is this is this person going to be serving in your presbytery in in a way that is, is really important? Um, for the ministry of Jesus Christ in your particular time and place. So it's not just about making it comfortable for the minister. It's also about the ministry of the presbytery and the congregations in the presbytery in, in the work you do. So you all have to be Solomon and, you know, have that wisdom um, to get this done. Okay. Um, ministers of other denominations can be made temporary members of presbytery. Um, and um, you can enroll them 
as a temporary member, then they meet your particular requirements. Um, per, you should have a rule about this established by your presbytery ruler rule. So, um, so let's say you've got a, you've got a small church up in the northwest part of your presbytery, and nobody's around, and it's a half time position. But you happen to have um, um, ELCA pastor up there who's also serving an ELCA church, and you might want to just make them a temporary member to cover the pulpit. You know, so there there are you can make them a temporary member. Um, and, you know, it doesn't make them PCUSA. They don't have to take our ordination vows. They, they just are enrolled uh, for their, their period of service. So when they're done serving you, they're done being a temporary member. It ends when their position ends. Um, Joyce? Yeah. Uh, this Joyce? is Keith, Keith McGuire with Providence Presbytery. Yeah. What is a reasoning for why we would want to go ahead and make someone either a member of the PCUSA or a temporary member of the US PCUSA versus COM simply granting permission for that minister after meeting with them and examining them to, to grant them permission to serve a particular congregation, to administer the sacraments, and to continue to review it just seems like that would be the more prudent way to go. Yeah. Because once they're in, they're in. Right. So the the tip the here's one of the advantages for uh, making somebody a temporary member of Presbytery. Then they'll come to Presbytery and bring the ruling elder from their church. That there's an expectation that as a temporary member of Presbytery, you are involved in Presbytery. That helps you as the Presbytery to stay connected and that congregation to stay connected to the Presbytery. So that's a, a real advantage. So the, the reason to make somebody PCUSA, that's for you to really ferret out. Some people, believe it or not, come and work, work and pray and worship with us and say, oh my gosh, this is the best way of being church. <laughs> I got here that way. Um, so, so if in the course of their discernment, it seems like to them that this, they have found their home for mission, for mission and ministry. That's really when you wanna look at maybe making them PCUSA. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just never had, to, you know, well, like you said, what what's the rush? And so that's that's oh, why right. I asked the question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Now ministers uh, can also become on PCUSA ministers. Um, so there is a section in the Book of Order that allows for ministers uh, against whom no, there's no disciplinary stuff going on, um, who who decide that for their particular reason in this particular point in their life. Um, they no longer uh, want to be a PCUSA minister, um, and so they can ask to be uh, released from th that office. Um, nothing wrong with that. You just, the Presbytery can vote to do that. Um, and um, that person, after a couple of years, something changes in their life, and they feel called to come back to ministry, would have to apply to come back into um, come back into the um, ministry of word and sacrament. Um, they need to make that application to the presbytery where they ask to be released. Um, and um, you, you as a you have would have a responsibility as the committee on ministry to um, certainly meet with them to, to to have an interview an examination. What has changed in their life? Um, do they have different understandings or beliefs that maybe? you might have issue with. Um, so um, you're going you're going to need to, you can't just do this automatically. You really do have to sit down with them and talk to them. This is that um, kind of that fourth category of membership. It's not, it's really, it's, it used to be called inactive. It's now called failure to be in a validated ministry. Um, these are those ministers of word and sacrament that aren't, you, you've, you kind of they've kind of fallen off your radar screen they're not doing anything they're not 
maybe not even filling out the member at large form anymore. They don't even, you know, you don't even know what they're, what they're doing. Um, you can, you can designate them as failing to be in validated ministry. If you don't have their address or contact information, it's hard to notify them. You must notify them that they're, that you're planning on doing that. Maybe sometimes that gets people off the dime and helps them get back into the system. If you have designated them as being as failing to be engaged in validated ministry, that's that kind of fourth category. You got to keep track of those people. Um, they get no voice or vote at Presbytery. If they just showed up at a Presbytery meeting out of the blue and thought they could just um, vote, they can't. Um, they, um, you as a COM need to report those names annually to the Presbytery and you can actually remove them from the role uh, after three years. Now, if they want to be restored, they can be restored under that old method, the one I just mentioned. This isn't renunciation. This is just dropping off the face of the earth. Um, so uh, it happens. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure if you stop the stated clerks, um, they will tell you that, you know, they've got a name or two of people. They don't know where they are. They don't know what they're doing. They, they've tried every which way to get a hold of them and they just, they can't. So it happens. Um, okay. Then there's, this is the renunciation of jurisdiction. Um, ministers of word and sacrament, actually ruling elders can do the same thing. Um, a, a renunciation of jurisdiction. Joyce, can I, yeah. can, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can we go back to the, the Catherine Berg from um, Charleston Atlantic? Um, the effect of removing somebody for failure to engage in validated ministry, they're no longer a member of Presbytery, but they're still considered ordained? No. 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 It's just, so it's, like, almost, it's just like the person who asked to be released. Okay. They're no longer, no. Yeah. No longer really, engaged in, uh, no longer in ordered ministry at all. Okay. Once, Thank once you. after three years, once you've removed yes. them. Yeah. Okay. And Joyce, um, uh -huh. when they, um, w when that happens, uh, we need to, the stated clerk, obviously, I would think needs to ask this person, where do you want your membership transferred? Yes. Or do we have a membership to transfer? Right. I mean, I'm asking a question. I mean, I'm assuming that a stated clerk, if a pastor did this and the presbytery then voted to um, release him or her, then the stated clerk, probably beforehand, I would think, would ask, where do you want your letter of transfer? Correct. Okay. If, if you have a way to get a hold of them. Right, this, right, well, right. Is, I, I guess I'm asking, I'm asking for the one, uh, the previous one, it, yeah. when they, okay. when they asked to be released. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You should, you should offer to send their, their letter of membership because they now become just uh, a PCUSA member. So the Presbytery holds their church membership. Um, which, which uh, church would they like to have their letter sent to? It doesn't have to be Presbyterian. You can send it to, you know, the Episcopal church, if, you know, if they'll take it. Yeah. Okay. Renunciation of jurisdiction. This is actually um, the, um, our constitution and our judicial process holds a very high bar of what it means, what, um, what you have to do in order to be considered uh, have, who have renounced jurisdiction of the Presbyterian church. Um, the easiest, most straightforward way, and it happens occasionally, is there is a signed written statement that is sent to the stated clerk that says, I renounce jurisdiction of Presbyterian Church, and and it really needs to be clear. Renounce. We always like to see the word "renounced" in there, and it must be signed. Can't be signed by their attorney. It has to be signed by them. If this is happening in the midst of judicial process, um, there is a, a constitutional amendments that are that are in the Book of Order that is very clear that this person shall not be permitted to work or volunteer in any way in a congregation. 
Um, now, if they move three states over, it's hard for that to follow them, but that's, that's the intent when you renounce in the midst of judicial process. Um, so there's also another way for renunciation to actually come about where you all, usually it's the committee on ministry, um, tells a minister that you're disapproving of their work. So let's say, for example, um, there's a little conflict in First Friendly Presbyterian Church and the um, uh, associate pastor and the pastor head of staff are at odds and the associate pastor moves across the street to um, the uh, mall over there and rents a storefront and opens a church and invites all of his friends to come and be part of the church across the street. You all, you all can say, oh, no, no, no. And we're disapproving this work. We're actually notifying you in writing. You uh, no, your authority is to us. You know, we have not approved your ministry. Um, and if it continues, you need to, cons you'll have to say, okay, we're gonna have a sit down. We're gonna talk this through. Um, and if it still continues, um, you all can assume renunciation, but you have to actually follow those steps. Disapprove, um, if it continues, consult with them. If it still continues, you tell them, we're going to presume that if you don't stop now, that this is a renunciation of jurisdiction. And if they don't stop, then you notify them that their actions through the disapproval of work um, has um, meant that they uh, are now no longer a PCUSA minister. They do have a right to challenge on the floor of Presbytery if, if that comes up. Usually if it gets that far, they don't care what you think. Um, also um, in renunciation, just, let me just say, in the midst of judicial process, that if, um, if a minister wants to come back after uh, renunciation of jurisdiction, any judicial process that was um, ongoing at the time of the renunciation comes back. And so they can't, they, have, they would have to go through that. Any questions about renunciation? Okay, there is also, um, you can dismiss ministers to other denominations. Some denominations don't care, don't, but uh, some do. And so you, when I, early in my ministry, one of our Presbyterian ministers was dismissed to the Roman Catholic Church. And, um, but as you are well aware, we've dismissed a fair number of ministers to ECO and before that um, to, um, um, EPC, so um, they don't really care, but we we care. All right, any questions about membership stuff? Okay, COM as uh, the facilitator. So the Presbytery is choice. Choice. as the Danny facilitator. Murphy. Yeah. Um, you, you gave an example of a temporary membership for us for I believe it was the ELCA, which we are in a, uh, have a form formally agreement with, but it can also be somebody from another Christian denomination, yes. correct? That's correct, there. correct. Okay. And I didn't talk about that. The, we have formula of agreement partners, uh, the ELCA, the UCC, I, I think later I do talk about that. Um, uh, the UCC, uh, RC, Roman Reformed Church in America, the um, ELCA, the Moravians, and the KPCA. We are in a formula of agreement with them, which has the, it's the orderly exchange of ministers, which basically means that um, ministers of those denominations can actually serve in our called and installed positions. Um, I mean, everybody's got to get on board and yeah 
get all the ducks in a row. They can actually be called and installed, just as our ministers can be called and installed in there without having to join a, a different denomination. So you can be, I could be a PCUSA minister serving an ELCA church um, in, a, in a called position um, and vice versa. It happens some. So, yeah, that yeah, we have we have one of those in our in Trinity Presbyterian. Yeah, and uh, and by the way, we released somebody to a Greek Orthodox. Did you? <laughs> wow. Now that's a change of theology. Okay. All right, Joyce. Uh, can, yeah, Joyce, Joyce, Joyce can question. I ask about the temporary membership? Sure. Uh, let's say. You know, sometimes the, a small, in our presentary Trinity, a small church will find a, a local person to preach, generally turns out to be a Baptist. Could, so if that were, if we determined that was actually a good fit for them, we could make that person a temporary member of the presbytery? You could. And the, and the advantage of that is rather than that, that happening sort of at the margins, you say, well, come on in. Right. And be a but part of what we're doing. You want to try to determine that this person but, really is who they say they are. Sure. There's a lot of homework to do in that. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes, you can. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And, and Joyce, uh, uh, to follow up with Blaine said, Danny Murphy, we, we do require in those situations certain course requirements through our lay school of theology for them to take uh, before we do that. Yeah. Great. Good. Uh, Joyce, I am a UCC minister serving a uh, Presbyterian uh, congregation in Providence Presbytery. And I guess my question is, does that mean I'm a temporary member of Pro Pro Providence Presbytery? Uh, Olivia, is he a temporary member of Providence Presbytery or is he under formula of agreement? <laughs> He's formula of agreement. Olivia is there somewhere. I don't see her. As far as I know, it's the formula of agreement. Okay. So that the UCC still holds my credentials. Right. Are you still hold your Bill? credentials under temporary as well? Are you installed, Bill? No, I'm. I am uh, state of supply. Yeah. Then okay. you're under the temporary. Yeah, he is. I had to step out, but yeah, he's. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. Let's talk about uh, Presbytery as uh, the as, um, facilitator, your role, COMS facilitator. So the Presbytery is to serve as the facilitator, facilitating the relations between congregations, ministers, and certified Christian educators and the Presbytery. So let's talk about congregations. Presbytery has a responsibility for organizing, receiving, merging, dismissing, and dissolving congregations. Now, not all of these are necessarily part of COM's work, but, um, but when it comes to merging and um, dismissing and dissolving, COM usually has a significant role. Um, oftentimes, it's COM's um, uh, assessment of the situation uh, that um, helps move this, uh, these, this congregation or congregations to one of these actions. It, it wouldn't necessarily be handled fully by the COM. Oftentimes that kind of work is given to a, um, an administrative commission to just take care of, um, but COM would probably have a significant role in at least the beginnings parts of mergings and dismissings and um, dissolving. Also, congregations always are looking for pastoral leadership. So um, this is where I know that most COMs spend a lot of their time is in helping congregations find pastoral leaders. We're gonna talk more significantly about that later. Um, you also have a responsibility to help them find moderators of session. You should have some rule about who can moderate sessions um, I know presbyteries that have trained ruling elders who have served on COM to serve as moderators in um, in, pres in, pres in um, congregations in, in sessions that don't have um, anyone. So you should make sure that your rule is uh, clear. Um, now we have an authoritative interpretation that is clear that 
PCUSA ministers should be the ones who are moderating the session because they're the presence and of the presbytery with the session. However, non-PCUSA ministers, UCC pastors, um, can be the moderators uh, of, of sessions when it, um, they have met the requirements of the presbytery um, to do so, um, to, to serve in temporary um, relationships. Um, you also you also need to, be, you should be knowing who's preaching in your pulpits. You don't want to find out that the dog groomers, uh, the cousin, the, the cousin of the stated clerk, I mean, of the clerk of sessions, dog groomers been preaching in the pulpit um, in uh, one of your churches for the past six months. And um, so you need to be um, aware for churches that have empty pulpits, who is actually doing the preaching are they, uh, do you have a rule about you? They got to come from our approved list. Um, and if any deviation of such would have to be approved by the, the, the COM, whatever that is. Um, so, and we're going to talk a little bit about more about that later. And especially for the administration of the sacraments. Now, the, the book of order allows for ruling elders to be taught to be, um, to, um, to learn how to administer the Lord's Supper. So you, um, if, if you have churches that it, um, there isn't going to be anybody around and can't come on the fourth Sunday of the month or whatever, you can actually um, train up some ruling elder or two from that congregation to do that. Um, that is, so to don't miss, don't don't miss that. And then, of course, there's com commission ruling elders who can do both of those. I do know of some presbyteries that have commissioned um, ruling elders with the broad brush strokes of saying they are serving as moderator of session for these five churches and um, administering the sacraments for these three churches. Uh, you know, so they have more of a presbytery wide um, uh, commission. Be creative. All right. Um, this, this, this is in the book of order, and I find this to be very aspirationally undefined. So the presbytery is to be open to hearing um, the concerns from congregations to provide pastoral care and stay connected and informed. So if you were to look at your manual of operations, could you say in my man, in the manual of operations of your committee on ministry, how is this being done? Can you see it being done? Are you just hoping that somehow word will get trickled down to you all if something is going well or going badly? Um, oh, or by the way, you know, oh, you, oh, you didn't know that we uh, voted to get rid of our pastor and he hasn't been here for the past three weeks. Um, so, so how that this is a big question for me is how do you go about uh, being the committee on ministry in such a way that you can provide pastoral care, you can stay connected and informed with your congregations, and you can hear their concerns. Now, used to be, I hear this all the time. So, whatever happened to the triennial visit? So in the book of order, it used to say that the presbytery, the committee on ministry was responsible to visiting with every congregation at least every three years. It is not mandated. And I will tell you, because it was, wasn't mandated, there are a lot of presbyteries, there were a lot of presbyteries that didn't, didn't really visit with any of their congregations. I know presbyteries that have said, we're going to visit every two years. Um, and um, we, I know presbyteries that have liaisons that have a responsibility for staying in touch with a particular congregation um, at least quarterly. So, um, you know, the question is, what are the ways in which um, you actually are staying in touch with your congregations? Now, the advantage of the, I'm going to go back to the, well, I'll, I'll get to that. So let's, let's talk about if you, if you have a, a liaison, if you're a liaison to a congregation, you could certainly get in their email chain, chain that tells you what's happening every Sunday or whatever, or, and it, or the newsletter that comes so that so you can get a sense of what's going on. Um, you certainly look at their website. 
it's always disheartening to me when I go to church websites and, and see um, the, the information about Easter 2021. And um, which, which it's, I, this is another thing I say, it's all information. So there's something going on there that they're, that they're, they aren't seeing the need to reach out to their community or make it easy even for their own people to find out how things uh, are going on. This is always a little more difficult. Show up for events. You know, if they're having a rummage sale, if they're having an anniversary of something, if they're dedicating their memorial garden, um, somebody from the Presbytery should show up and be the face of the Presbytery. Tell them you're coming. Tell them ahead of time you're coming. Don't spring it on them. Just make sure they, they know that somebody from the Presbytery will be showing up. It is important, uh, usually the staff of the Presbytery ha has the biggest role in this and talking with the pastors. Talking with the pastors is good. That is not always gonna give you the full picture of what's going on in the church. So the question is who else do you need to be in conversation with um, on a regular basis? Clerk of session, Christian educator, I, you know, whatever. Um, and um, it is still, in my opinion, important to have regular session visits. You have to define regular, where you actually, you're on the docket and it's not to give a five minute welcome from the Presbytery. It's to engage with them in some significant conversation about their ministry, about their pastoral work, about their community, about their church building that's falling apart around your ears, wh whatever those things are. Um, and um, to make sure that you can, that they know you're coming, it's gonna be an important part of a, a session meeting where you're gonna have these conversations. Um, any questions about that? So let me also talk then a little more about administrative commissions. So the, the book of order allows for administrative commissions. It mean, basically means uh, the Presbytery can give a small group of people the responsibility to do the Presbytery work and just get it done. So in Presbyteries, that means to ordain and install ministers. You do this all the time. Um, you appoint an administrative commission to get that work done. Um, to examine and receive members. Um, I know a lot of presbyteries that allow their committee on ministry um, to um, just in regular calls, a, a new pastor coming in um, from another presbytery that you do the examination. We're gonna talk more about that, that you receive them into membership and you don't have to take it to the floor of presbytery. It, it's um, you've been given the authority to do that, or some presbyteries actually have an examination administrative commission that does um, sometimes both COM and CPM. They kind of have the, they're good at that and, and have um, the expertise for that. Um, administrative commissions for developing immigrant fellowships and organizing new congregations. Um, Merging congregations, forming union congregations, or joint congregational witness, which is uh, two, two or more denominations joining together to create a, a congregation. Um, the, uh, this is oftentimes, especially merging congregations and um, dismissing, uh, dissolving congregations, administrative commissions are really kind of the best way to get the work done. Joyce? Yes. This is James Platt from Providence. You had been giving us references in the book of book of order, and you aren't now. And I'm wondering. Oh, that's an oversight. Because uh, I was following, and now I can't. It's in G three, chapter one. Um, um, the general principles of councils uh, under commissions and committees and commissions is the first part, three o one o nine. But then when you get into the section about um, and then the next, and then um, and it, uh, you go to B on the next page, on page forty-six. There's a whole long list of all sorts of, that which is not an exhaustive list. These are examples of how administrative commissions can be used, especially by presbyteries. Right. Thank you. I, I just prefer having a place to match these things up. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Yeah. And Joyce, um, if um, um, is it possible? I mean, you can review these slides. Um, add in the references if there are some missing, uh, and then we can um, 
send out this PowerPoint? Yes, I'll give it to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, uh, um, visiting councils affected with disorder. It's a nice way to phrase it. And then this is a um, an addition that's um, pastorally very important. Um, this is really about pastoral inquiry in sex abuse cases when the judicial process is ended. This is usually means when an allegation of sexual abuse has been made against um, a ruling elder or a teaching elder, and then they've renounced jurisdiction in the midst of such um, an allegation, which ends our judicial process. But when uh, the presbytery sees the need for some pastoral care along that line, they can put together, it's like a truth and reconciliation uh, commission to uh, help uh, the parties involved um, get through that. All right. Then there's, uh, this is, we're going to talk a little more about this. This is an in, inquiry into the reported difficulties um, in a presbytery. Um, and in, th in theory, uh, you know, they're going to welcome your presence and they're going to take your adv <laughs> advice. Um, so um, hopefully, uh, and we're going to talk more about this when we get into conflict. The sooner you get in there, the better. Don't wait until it explodes. If you hear rumblings, get in there as soon as you can. And you're going to advise the session on uh, the appropriate actions they can take to move forward, um, to offer to help as a mediator. If you've got the skills and the expertise somewhere in your presbytery to be a mediator, um, or if you don't, um, to help them find a mediator, to help uh, uh, them get through the particular problem they're dealing with. Um, and help them, helping them to uh, correct any difficulties that are going on. And if at all necessary, next steps, which really has to do with uh, the possible assumption of juris original jurisdiction, if it all goes to pot, so. Okay, so uh, any questions about any of that, about your role with congregations? It's not as well defined as with ministers, which means that oftentimes they get neglected, so don't neglect them. All right, so the abilities that are needed on COM. Hopefully you're not gonna see yourself in these, but you might. Um, we don't need on our committees on ministry mean and aggressive people. Um, who feel like they are the people with the big stick that are going to come in and they're going to beat the presbyteries, cheer congregations and ministers into line. Um, nor do we need people who are so nice and so kind that they would not want to say anything that would hurt anyone's feelings um, or make them uncomfortable. We um, really do need people who can... Um, be firm, understand what their responsibility is, be pastoral, but, um, but to help the presbytery uh, and the congregations and the ministers to move toward doing this, uh, the right thing of all for the glory of God and for the church of Jesus Christ. That's the hope, all right? We also don't need lone rangers. I suggest, and I know this is hard. It's it it puts uh, it 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 makes it, it hard to pull off, especially for in person meetings. Not so hard with with Zoom. Um, I always encourage no less than two people from a COM when you're when you're visiting with a minister or you're visiting with a congreg with a session or a congregation. Um, part of it is. You need um, extra sets of ears to hear what's been said. And occasionally you need a witness to say, yeah, no, that did not happen. Because if it's just your word against the word of the bullying ruling elder on the session, um, you, you probably are going to lose that. Just saying. So we do, what we do need is we need people who understand they are part of a committee on ministry, commission on ministry. There's more than one person who 
makes these decisions. Um, but we need people who will communicate clearly um, that they understand expectations and next steps that they can discern together with the committee. They can pray for the pastors. They can pray for the churches. They can help strategize for, especially in the midst of conflict, what it is they're supposed to do. Um, and just folks who can prayerfully uh, discern together as the committee on ministry, or if it's a subgroup of committee on ministry, um, within the parameters of our book of order and your presbytery policies and um, procedures, which also means we need, we don't need yes people. Um, COM needs members who have the ability to say no when it is necessary. I will tell you, one time I was doing a COM training and I, and I asked the, the, press, the COM members, I said, have any of you voted yes for somebody that you really wanted to vote no for? And about three hands went up. And I said, why? And one of them said, it was too late. We were being asked too late in the process. And um, it just felt like, you know, it, it, I was going to be the bad guy. And again, bad guy, you don't want to be the bad guy. So, um, you, and, and you all in COM, this should be the safe place, especially when you're discerning together, to raise your issues and uh, concerns that you may have about a particular situation, about a particular candidate being considered um, by uh, a congregation to be their next pastor, um, all of those things um, that at least, at least to, to, to have that place you may, you may get to where you'll say, I, I can go for this, but to be able to raise your concerns, you need to be able to do that. Any are questions? We, yeah. Are we going to take a break? Yeah, and I'm almost done. And then we will. Okay. okay. All right. So the resources you need to have it, you need to have, you got to make sure you have, 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 have. You need the current book of order. It's purple. It's been purple for four years now because of COVID. Um, you need your committee on ministry manual and policies. Um, some, some of y'all, all y'all have uh, big fat COM manuals. Huh. And some of you have a couple of skinny pages or it's in your presbytery policies, but you need to know where those policies are. You also need a copy of On Calling a Pastor. That is a resource that is available to your congregations. I mean, and you need to understand how your presbytery uses it or doesn't use it. I know presbyteries that have created their own On Calling a Pastor manual that fits to their particular presbytery. Um, <clears throat> and you need just the regular presbytery manual you know, so that you know how to get, get the business into the presbytery and policies and directories like, and the minister's list. Um, you need the minutes from the prior COM meetings so that you know what has been done in the past. Um, and you need to be prepared with uh, some scriptures and prayers. You just never know when you get into a session meeting when you might need to be uh, praying for those folks or doing a, a little devotional. So you should have those in your pocket. Um, and also, you need to know where your church and minister files are and what's in them. Um, and so that you can, go, you can go see some of the history of what's going on in, uh, in that particular congregation. I'll tell you, when I went to be the pastor at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in um, Albuquerque, I asked to see the file at the Presbyterian office. And that's, office, and that's when I found, found the, the letter from the session about the organizing pastor who was touching women in the coat room. And so first I'd heard of that. And um, so, yeah, there's stuff sometimes in there that's interesting and helpful. All right. Yeah, okay. We're gonna, let's just uh, take a break and let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Pausing your workout and workout. All right, 10 minutes. Sounds good, okay. 10 minutes. So that would be at, uh, 1048. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, everybody. Trans. Oh, yeah. 
um, they have the church trends in each congregation in the PCUSA. They have demographic reports about the community around the, uh, the church. They have congregational surveys um, that you can you use them if, um, the, if the congregation wants to um, kind of see what the people, all the congregation members want. Um, and then um, some other, other resources as well. Um, I know that there are a lot of presbyteries that use uh, entities like uh, Mission Insight and some other things that can provide you with this demographic information. Um, if your presbytery pays for it, yay, hey. But if not, uh, you can get a lot of stuff for free, your per capita dollars at work um, from um, the uh, Office of the General Assembly. Uh, I mean, not for the, from the Presbyterian Mission Agency through the re research services. <laughs> so you're the ones that are going to help them determine whether or not they need a mission study. Um, you're also going to be the one to help them assess their pastoral leadership options. There are lots of options. Um, if it, it's, and usually, you know, if it's a pretty healthy congregation, financially stable with a large enough um, congregation, you, you know, it's installed pastor, installed pastor, that's where you're going to end up ordinarily. But for congregations that are smaller, their finances are a little iffy, um, maybe they don't have part-time work um, or other things. There are some other options. And so you're going to help them figure out what's best for them um, in their look at the next um, uh, the next pastoral leadership. So minister of word and sacrament, um, installed or temporary, um, you all, and part of the COM um, process is going to determine whether the particular work that this minister can do will be helpful to that church. And you understand that ministers are accountable to the presbytery. They can get a, a ruling elder commissioned to particular service. Their, pre, their par, uh, preparation and instruction is determined by the presbytery. I know a lot of um, you all have lay leadership schools and, and um, share back and forth. This is a limited pastoral service and it's assigned um, by the presbytery. Um, it can be, uh, uh, it's like contract up to three years, but it is renewable. Um, um, I would say most of the time commission ruling elders are um, um, for part-time, but that's not exclusively. I know large churches that have commission ruling elders serving on their staff doing pastoral care. So um, th there, are, there are creative ways to use um, a lot of these um, options. The, presby the um, presbytery may authorize the commission ruling elder to moderate the session, to administer the sacraments, and to officiate at marriages where permitted by state law. The commission ruling elder works under the supervision of the presbytery, and as mentioned earlier, um, a minister of word and sacrament is assigned to be their mentor and supervisor. Again, they can have ministers of other denominations, especially in some of your more rural areas. You might have some ministers of other denominations who are available. Um, they can they can regularly if they're a temporary. Um, um, uh, if you've approved it, they can. Um, again, we've talked about formula of agreement uh, pastors. They can be installed into um, our PCUSA churches. Um, they uh, don't, they still maintain their ordination and membership in their um, denomination, um, one of the formula of agreement denominations. They also usually participate in whatever um, benefits plan is part of that denomination. The, ch the church, PCUSA church would pay for it like we do with the Board of Pensions, but um, yeah. Um, temporary members of Presbytery, again, have to meet the requirements for preparation and um, you can um, transfer ministers in, we talked about this earlier. Um, so they have some options. 
um, of what direction to go. And, and it also broadens them, their pool for who, the, who they can be considered if uh, they can look at any or all of these. Now, if options for small, smaller, smallest churches, um, we've talked about um, CREs, uh, often part-time, sometimes uh, uh, H, uh, honorably retired ministers are willing to serve part-time. Um, other options include yoked congregations. Uh, it, I, will, I will tell you that a lot of churches hate that word yoked. So you say, oh, we share a pastor. That usually flies better. Um, you can use uh, one or two pastors, two or more churches. Uh, oftentimes a clergy couple, I know of a clergy couple that served in Indiana, had three churches and it was, um, uh, I wanna say it was a position and a half total. Um, and um, so you can be as creative as you want. Um, I know presbyteries that have created parishes, larger geographic areas with a cluster of churches with a team of pastoral leadership, like that includes a pastor or pastors and um, maybe some CREs. And then whatever else creative way um, you can imagine in order to help pastors find um, the, the kind of the, the pastoral leadership that they're gonna need. You're gonna help guide them to figure that out. Until they know what they're looking for, they aren't gonna know how to look for it. So help, help them figure out what they're looking for. They're gonna to need to write a position description um, so that uh, you know exactly what um, is being asked of this person. Um, there's, a there's, a, there's an art between being so vague that you, anything fits in it and being so specific that you can't do anything out of uh, that checklist. So you want it to be specific enough but also with some freedom um, to, to be uh, to to uh, to address emerging ministries as they arise in the in the life of the congregation. You also are going to have to help them assess their finances. Uh, I know it shouldn't be about the money, but um, it often is. Um, as we've watched churches that their as their numbers have declined, as their finances have declined, they've gone from having a full time pastor to a three quarter time pastor and now maybe only a two thirds time pastor. Um, so you're gonna have to help them look. Um, I remember when I was on a COM and the pastor called me up and said, the church is gonna be out of money next month. And I said, what, what, uh, 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 and, in the, and, he's, and he'd been there one year. And um, I said, like, really next month? Yeah, so um, you really need to, <laughs> I know, and there are sessions that don't want to show you their money. Don't, so you're going to have to help work, work with them on that so that you can understand, can you pay this person's um, salary and benefits um, for the foreseeable future? Or if, you know, if it's a designated position, you know, for the next three years. Um, how, is this, how is this going to fit, fit together? Um, remind them about uh, paying pulpit supply and moderators and don't forget the mileage. Um, pastors in terms of call must meet the minimum terms that includes vacation and study leave and reimbursed expenses and benefits and other um, whatever, SICA. Um, be clear whether it's full-time or part-time. And installed pastors are required to be in the pastor's participation of the Board of Pensions, which is um, a significant percentage. Um, there for um, temporary pastors, there are some other options, which um, between Elizabeth and Clark, our Board of Pensions reps, they can help you on, and help a congregation understand what benefits um, are available um, to uh, as they're putting together um, the salary package for uh, their next pastor. Um, I will tell you, I, I bristle when I hear, well, can't we get a commission ruling elder cheaper? <coughs> yeah, probably. Um, and, and for some folks are, who are available because they're in the community. Um, but that shouldn't be, it shouldn't be, like I always say, it shouldn't be about the money. 
um, but maybe that's um, what um, they're going to have they're going to have to do. Um, um, so help help them make that determination about their finances. Um, again, Joy, it, Joyce, excuse me. Quick question about CREs. Um, what is your philosophy on a CRE being trained to serve in their home church? Well, actually, when they first started, that was the intent. Yeah, I know. And um, for some reason, Presbyterians decided that was a bad idea and have made it so that they can't. And, I, you know, I've seen it work well in, when, in the old way. I've also seen it not work well, especially when um, the CRE isn't the CRE anymore, but they're still a member of the congregation. And um, it, the, the role gets a little confused, uh, sometimes by the CRE, sometimes by members of the congregation. And, and yeah, so I, I think you're the best judges, especially when you're looking at personalities and who's available. Um, on whether that, but I, but I do know presbyteries have actually made rules that you can't serve in your own church. Again, we might fall oh, back is, on the uh, phrase in the Book of Order: "If it meets the mission needs." Right. Yeah, Danny. Uh, yeah, I know uh, in Trinity Presbytery, uh, we did do that initially, uh, but we had a situation where you had a, a, a CRE. And the congregation was wanted to move toward getting a full-time pastor because they were able to do that. Uh, but the CRE was undermining that whole process because he wanted to stay there as the pastor and not have them move on to anyone else. Uh, so we, for a while, we said that, no, you can't serve in your own congregation. And uh, in more recent times, we sort of shift that to well, we're going to take a look at this on a case by case basis. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it. It's really on a case by case basis. And which means you really do need to know your commission ruling elder well. You need to know the congregation well enough um, so that you can see whether or not that, that could work. And, and kind of and use your crystal ball about what the future is going to hold. All right. Um, so there are some things that you also need to talk, be aware of when you're talking about the congregation's assets and liabilities, um, uh, income versus endowment. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, some people have money in the bank and they aren't gonna touch it and that's fine. Um, but is that okay to take money from um, endowments to pay the pastor? I mean, that's, again, you're gonna have to assess um, the finances. Um, most churches don't have manses anymore, but some still do. And so you have to, but I will tell you, the most folks looking for a call aren't, aren't always excited about a manse, but that doesn't mean it's not a deal breaker. Again, talk, you got to understand what the benefits are and the cost of those benefits that the church is giving. And I will tell you that church likes to take the board of pensions and plop it on top of salary and housing and say, look how much money we're giving the pastor. No, you know, you go to the board of pensions website to understand what effective salary is. Basically, it's salary and housing plus a few other little things that most churches don't offer. Um, so because that's really what the pastor or commercial ruling elder is going to live on. So and you need to consider the cost of living for the community. You know that you have different communities that don't cost much to live in and others that cost quite a bit. And especially employment opportunities for spouses, what's available in the region and what type of search can they afford? Meaning, are you gonna bring somebody from California to be your next pastor? Are you gonna move them? Um, or are you gonna do a more regional search or, a, or are you gonna just look of who's in our own backyard? Um, so give those uh, thoughts to the finances. Okay, so there is a process for calling a pastor, but it is not set in stone. Um, there is flexibility in your pres presbytery's process, um, but I'm gonna say it kind of goes like this, okay? 
dissolve the pastoral relationship, appoint a moderator, find pulpit supply or temporary pastor or bridge interim or whatever you're doing. And you see, there's, a, there's, there's nothing there, but all that stuff about you're going to help them then figure out what they're going to do next. And if you're going to make them do a mission study and it, and once you've got that all figured out, you're going to elect the PNC, the congregation's going to elect the pastor nominating committee. Now, if you're going for temporary pastor or CRE, you're just going to work with the session and they might create a separate committee to do this work. They might do it themselves. Um, you're going to put together a mission information form, whether you're actually going to use CLC or not. Um, it's a it's a good co uh, common denominator of explaining um, who, who this church is and the mission um, and ministry that's going on there, um, th which will get um, personal information forms and resumes um, in response to what's um, being advertised out there. Um, that a search committee is going to review those personal information uh, forms and any other material that they receive. They're going to do the reference checking. There are five references on the personal information form. They're going to check with all of them. They should check with all of them. Um, you're going to say, yeah, we're good uh, on the people, the, the people that you're most interested in looking at. Um, we all are experts on Zoom now, so Zooms have become a great way to get uh, better acquainted, the, um, the kind of the first go round, get your for short list or maybe, and that short list I have seen can sometimes be one person um, and bringing them on site um, somewhere along the line. This is where sooner is better than later. A presbytery examination needs to happen. Um, what in the presbytery I served in Santa Fe, um, when people came on site, we required that during that on site visit that they had an examination with COM. And uh, we weren't going to wait till the church, the congregation said, Oh, yes, this is our, this is Jesus coming to serve us, and we love them, and we're going to, uh, we, we didn't wait that long. Um, then a call will be extended, which will include the terms of call, which hopefully you all have already looked at, um, especially in terms of the MIF, because you're going to have to approve that, um, and are comfortable that that's uh, a doable for um, and and adequate doable for the church and adequate for the pastor. There will be a congregational meeting um, to call that pastor and. Uh, then hopefully they will hopefully start and then be installed. So that's the broad brush strokes, but there is flexibility within this process. So um, you may have a very spelled out process in your um, presbytery that you're going to follow. So if you look at the um, on calling a pastor book, um, it will say right in there that this that this does not override your presbytery policies. Your presbyteries override the um, on calling a pastor. Um, so um, one of the things that's helpful is y'all can learn from each other about what worked and what didn't work in particular congregations. Um, um, you can try some new things. Um, uh, I would encourage you to try things. Don't rush to policy until you say this really works great and we want to keep doing that. Um, so um, it's so anyway, so work within kind of a framework, but have some flexibility with it. And so Joyce, I, I want to just share uh, what some may know, um, most probably not, is that the South Carolina execs meet monthly. Um, it, we've been since the pandemic almost uh, entirely by Zoom, but uh, prior to that, we would we would meet uh, monthly at Trinity office because it's uh, kind of centrally located for all of us. And uh, Danny has to provide the coffee and he takes the notes and uh, we do the driving in and we 
we share best practices, we confer about uh, transitional pastors. If we've got a good transitional pastor, we try to keep them in South Carolina. And, um, and as we do this training um, and uh, commissioner training, et cetera. So um, we confer a lot about, you know, what, 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 hey, how are you handle, how is your COM handling this particular issue? Yeah. Yeah. So let me also say, if you look in the book of order, there is, it's G20803. There is one small paragraph about the call process, which isn't particularly helpful if you're on the ground working with a, a session or congregation or PNC um, that's looking for a pastor. But it says, according to the process of the presbytery and prior to making its report to the congregation, the pastor nominating committee shall, 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 receive and consider the presbytery's counsel on the merits, suitability, and availability of those considered for the call. When the way is clear for the committee to report to the congregation, the committee shall notify the session, which shall call a congregational meeting. So that's it. That's how they define um, the call process. It's two sentences. Um, but the reality is, is the presbytery um, is in this process and needs to be advising um, the, the PNC. So I will tell you, one of the biggest complaints I hear is about how long this process takes. Um, and, um, if I just read to you, it's according to your processes, you can make this go as not, not just you, the Presbytery, but the Presbytery has a hand in making this go slow or making it move along. So does the PNC. Um, so there are some things that you can help them consider that you all can consider in helping a church move a little more swiftly um, through uh, finding a new pastor. Um, I, you know, I will tell you that um, sometimes I, I will actually say every single one of us in ministry are in transitional ministry at this at this juncture in our culture and our time. Um, I, none of us can plan longer than maybe two or three years down the road. Um, so does um, if we're if we're looking at. Um, getting a transitional pastor in there who's going to be there for, oh, I don't know, 12 months to 18 months, and then you're going to, and then the new pastor is going to come. You know, that might be helpful to a church that really doesn't understand who they are, what they're about, have had some conflict or um, need some new direction or, or what needs some really skilled folks to help them find out where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. Um, but if, uh, so there are there are people that would, would tell you that in healthy congregations, a big gap between pastor to the next installed pastor sometimes is um, a little slowing in momentum. And so those are the things you're going to have to weigh um, in helping um, a congregation find their next pastor and what you're what you're going to require of them. Um, are you going to require the same thing of every single congregation? Or are you going to do it on a case by case basis? Um, and I would argue for a case by case basis. So it's going to take how long? Okay, you can help move it along. Here's one. Here's one thing. Um, the 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 calendar. The process moves slowly by calendar sometimes. So are are you going to make um, PNCs wait till the next regularly called meeting of the COM? Are you going to make PNC's way to the next regularly called meeting of the presbytery to call a pastor. Let's say your presbytery meeting is the first Tuesday in April, and on the first Thursday of April, uh, a congregation has reached an agreement with a candidate, and by God, that presbytery isn't going to meet until uh, September. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna do that. So. There are ways to move up calendars. And Zoom is a, is a great 
we've learned, it may not be great about everything, but it is a way that we can call meetings and show up to meetings and have quorums at meetings um, to get some things um, going along. Um, and again, if Presbytery is only meeting three times a year, hopefully they've delegated to you the ability to approve these calls um, to receive ministers into membership in the Presbytery. Uh, but again, also, how often are you meeting? Um, as a COM? Are you meeting quarterly? Are you meeting monthly? Are you willing to call meetings? Um, I would encourage you to be willing to call meetings to help move, move it along. Um, <clears throat> so um, the other thing is there's actually a Vicar of Dibley. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's a Vicar of Dibley with the church council trying to fix the date for the Valentine dinner. And that meeting takes um, about two hours to try to find a date and it's going to happen and the valentine dinner is going to happen in october um you know if you if you're trying to make sure everything works um you're just going to be postponing and um if you can encourage a search committee a pastor nominating committee to put on their calendar for every week it's easier to cancel a meeting than it is to schedule a meeting. So if you can get them to do that, um, it, it is very helpful. Um, I, yeah, okay, so help them do that. So let's talk about the pastor nominating committee. Um, so the pastor nominating committee can be elected after Presbytery approves the effective date of dissolution, after Presbytery has decided the congregation is ready and able to proceed um, to seek a new pastor. And that's some of that finances, position and description, the kind of position, and after receiving permission from the Presbytery, all three of those things, then they can elect a pastor nominating committee. So this is where we can talk about the co-pastor model moving to the, yeah. So there are there are churches and have gotten permission from presbyteries to um, have the head of staff who's retiring uh, announce their effective date of dissolution is going to be in one year or 18 months down the road and calling a co-pastor to come and serve with that person who would then in theory leave at the end of that 18 12 months, 18 months. And then this person would be the new head of staff. Um, does that work? It has. Does it not work? It has not worked in some places. I know of a presbytery in this synod that's having that happen in one of their churches. Um, so, um, you really, again, the discernment of whether you allow this to happen. The reality about that, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, you can do with it what you want, is that a lot of times it's the control issue of the head of staff who's retiring, wanting to make sure that um, the ministry happens just as he or she set it up and um, wants to continue with that and, and gets them the ability to pass on their learnings and maybe even their blessing to the next person. Um, so you all decide whether or not you're willing to do that. I, I don't know if any Presbyterians have said, yeah, we're not made it a rule, but anyway. All right. Oh, no, we just did this. Okay. So the session, um, can call a congregational meeting uh, to elect the pastor nominating committee. They need to be representative of the whole congregation. And the committee's duty, their job is to find the candidate that they are going to uh, present to the cast, to the to the congregation for their election as pastor. Um, so there's some uh, suggested uh, steps to go through. So um, the session would recommend, and you can help the session recommend, how many people should be on that pastor nominating committee. Um, the 
churches, con usually it's the church's congregational nominating committee that would find those people. Um, they would invite the congregation to submit names. Most, a lot of people submit their own names. Um, and so they would take into consideration the number of people that they would, um, that session recommends, they would take into consideration, again, is this representative of the whole congregation? Um, and um, then uh, uh, they get to work with you all, um, guiding them in their process. Um, and um, there is also the ability they can elect, they can nominate from the floor and there has been more than one congregation that has said, we wanna add more people to the nominating, uh, to the pastor nominating committee. I will tell you if you, uh, nine is a little large, um, five is a little small, uh, you, you, you know, you have to, whatever advice you give them um, can be helpful in helping them again, get the work done um and you go along you gotta be joyce, remember um yeah. joyce as an interim pastor and and now as a uh interim transitional presbytery leader um our process our transitional process uh, um states uh, written process but i always always recommended this uh, always had us do this uh, um and when i was an interim and that is that whoever is tasked with uh, um, presenting a slate to the congregation for the PNC, whether sometimes it's a session, sometimes it's the nominating committee. Uh, the session really decides because it's not specified in any place. Um, then uh, the session, whether it's the nominating committee, they find out how many they're going to be nominating. Um, and then we set, then the session calls the meeting. The session makes the first recommendation to the congregation that the PNC size is set at whatever, five, seven, nine, six. And, and I always say, don't worry about it being even because they're generally almost always going to be working by consensus. Um, and uh, so then, um, so then that motion. The You're not asking the congregation to vote on that, are you? Yes, vote on the size of the PNC first, and then there's a slate. So if they have nominations from the floor, just like with elder, you know, it's a class of four, it's a class of three. So they have to, they can, of course, nominate from the floor, but it's going to be a ballot. Because if they start nominating three old uh, uh, males, Yep. That sh shifts the whole um, demographics of the PNC and its desire sure. for diversity. Yeah. They, but <laughs> they have the right to elect whoever they want and the number they want. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so here's, here's what the, the thing that churches make the mistake about. Um, and you can try to help them see this, the, the nominating committee that pulls the pastor nominating that, um, that th while the Book of Order says they're supposed to be representative of the whole congregation, what often happens is we get factions. You know, we have to put so-and-so on here because, you know, they're, they're the choir is the center of the, you know, the church business. We got to get them on there. And then we got to get somebody from the youth group. And oftentimes these folks are um, conflicted with one another. Um, and, um, and you want to take that, you need to be aware of that before you put them on the, nominate them to be on the nominating committee together. You need folks who, while it's representative of the whole church, work and play well with others, because this is a group that's going to have to make a decision together. And hopefully not one person standing on the rock of, you know, this is my one issue. So be careful about that. Um, the mission information form, sometimes it's a bit used as the church we wish we were. Um, um, and I can't tell you I, how many pastors I said, this is not the church that was presented to me in the MIF or in the interview. Um, so your job as the past in the presbytery is to make sure that the mission information form is actually an accurate representation of um, this congregation and the pastor that they're looking for. Um, 
it is, uh, but let me remind you that MIF is not the be all and end all of which ministry is going to be defined. It is to be an accurate representation so that the church and the person considering the position can, can have a, I call this, have a cup of coffee to determine whether or not there's the potential for a future long-term relationship. It's this, these are, this is not a plan um, for uh, rocket science for building a nuclear weapon. This is, this is more like internet dating, you know, do we, are we going to get together? So, so when we start nitpicking about um, that word should be an rather than the um, is not necessarily as helpful as the big picture about being reflective of what this congregation is about. And please make sure that the MIF is correct in the amount of money that they put in and the effective salary. I can't tell you how many times this has gone by a presbytery and it's the whole package, mileage, continuing ed, and boy, people think, whoa, whoa, look at that salary. No, so your job's to make sure um, it's, it's an accurate representation. Um, also, you be, care be careful when you read it about um, how much is snuck, snuck in there about the pastor that we want. Perfect pastor, you know him with his lovely wife and two children, probably a dog down below that you can't even see. Um, you're gonna wanna make sure that um, the, the nominating committee and the session and the congregation understand the Ch Presbyterian Church's commitment and guarantee of full participation and representation. Um, so that they're going to include looking at everybody. Some people who are not even gonna look like what they may have in mind, because by goodness, we have a God that does surprising things. And if we aren't open to hearing who God is calling based upon how somebody looks or their particular circumstance, um, then we're going to um, uh, miss whom God would, would choose to be um, the best pastor for us. Um, okay. We also, um, so then they're gonna start waiting for the, uh, the uh, PIFs to roll in. And a lot of um, nominating committees think it, well, okay, we've written our MIF, if, uh, here it is. If you build it, they will all come. That is um, not true. I mean, it's true to a small extent, but they, they also need to be proactive in their search. So that's besides you using church leadership connection, they're gonna make sure that um, they know uh, in our, your presbytery, whatever mechanism your presbytery has for getting the word out, um, you're gonna make sure you're, you're gonna look in your neighboring presbyteries. You're gonna see what semin who's graduating from the seminaries in our synod. Um, who do we have from our ecumenical partners? You're gonna have, gonna have to help them do some of the work to do a more proactive search. Um, church leadership connection is a whole thing of matching, um, and it's, it's, it's church-wide, and it matches on a number of um, factors. Um, you can read more about that um, on their website, um, but you have a responsibility to make sure, uh, church leadership connection, you can't get a PIF in there unless you've been signed off on by a stated clerk. But there will be people who will um, send uh, resumes, PIFs directly to a search committee. And you're going to want to make sure you, before they give them too much consideration that you've had a look at them, uh, that they are who they say they are, that, they, um, that those being considered um, meet our requirements, the presbytery's requirements, the denominational requirements to be um, a pastoral leader in one of our congregations. So that's sometimes you have to pry them away from the fingers of the nominating committee. They may also want to advertise um, uh, Presbyterians Today, Presbyterian Outlook, um, networks of folks um, to try to find do in a more proactive way. I will tell you of a church that I know of in this uh, synod um, who went through the Presbytery uh, statistics for the nearby Presbyteries and looked for churches of the same size. Um, and sent them directly 
uh, solicitation to say if you've if you're looking or considering a new call, we invite you to consider a new call with us and, and included a copy of the MIF. How it, you know, be as proactive as you, as you wanna be. Um, okay. Um, uh, there will be times when um, you're gonna need to say no and the earlier, the better before they have fallen in love with the one and only. So, um, uh, don't be pushed into saying yes, but um, if, if you can set up a system in a way that you can say no to some people, get them out of the mix beforehand. Um, so there's reference checks and background checks that will be done. Um, they, we ex I would expect every reference that is on a PIF for people that they're interested in, that they will have the nominating, the press and nominating committee would have contacted them and um, uh, had a whole system. You're going to help them figure out how they're going to contact those folks. Um, you should not be letting them contact um, their cousin's brother who happens to be in the neighboring community, find out more information um, because that's how word gets out and uh, ministries can um, be um, impacted. There is also a thing that we do in the Presbyterian church, which is the, which we call the exec to exec check, Presbytery to Presbytery check which is just to make sure that there are no red flags. You're on mute, Joyce. Yeah, Joyce, we lost you. You're on and mute. Joyce, somehow you hit your mute, yeah. And Blaine, I think, has a Please. question. There it is. Sorry. Yeah. And um, Blaine so, has a question, I believe, if he wants to unmute himself and ask. Yeah. I do. Um, in your in the process you're outlining here, you're saying it's important to do reference checks before having uh, an in-person interview. Is that is yes? That what you're, well, no, 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 not necessarily. Um, before you ever bring them. So I, I I would my recommendation is you you start with what you got. You sort through them, the ones that rise to the top, you say, okay, we're really interested in these. So we might want to ask for some more information. We might want to, you know, we might want to say, do you have a, or look at their additional information. Do you have a sermon we can look at? Do you, um, um, if you had some extra questions you wanted to ask them or, um, but then that, then you might um, want to have a conversation with them. If you're very interested in them, you might then, because five references for each person you're very interested in, then usually you're down to 10 people to do that. Maybe, maybe five um, is a lot to do, but um, anyway, yeah. So anywhere along that line, when, after you've found interest, either before you see them on Zoom, I'm talking before, but certainly before they ever show up on your doorstep, here. You're gonna so just to clarify, you, you, it would make sense to have maybe an hour long Zoom conversation before you call all their references. Sure. Yeah. You might find early on in that Zoom call that that's not going to work. Yeah. Save yourself some work. Yeah. Yeah. And I've also uh, had uh, PNCs who make the initial contact come to find out that the pastor simply says, well, yeah, I have my PIF out there, but really right now, even though it says you're supposed to be ready for a move in nine months, they end up saying, well, I was just trying to discern and at this particular time, no, I'm not interested in, in moving. Yeah. Yeah, um, Joyce, if I may, just from the, yeah, another one from the EP's perspective, I try to, uh, sometimes there's some pushback from PNCs um, about this. You know, you're trying to determine our pastor, you know, and we don't like this idea that you're going to, you know, uh, possibly come back and tell us we can't interview this person in, 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 uh, in person. And um, I'm always saying that e EPs, uh, it, it, they're not trying to necessarily change the church from being progressive to conservative, conservative, progressive. They're trying to honor who the congregation is, and they're trying to make sure that there's a good match. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, because we don't want a headache because that's a lot of work for us then and the COM. And so I say, before you say to them that you want to bring them in, let me call their EP and kind of get the straight scoop because out there in the secular world, 
you know, the only thing you can find out is they started on this date and they left on this date. They started on this date and they left on. We can find out a lot more. And we can also find out, for instance, there's red flags. And uh, I talked with uh, my COM a, a couple of few years ago when I came. A red flag for me is that, you know, no, uh, this per, and the way I respond to the, um, the liaison who then tells the PNC is this person would not be approved for membership in this presbytery. And the two, want, the two that um, come to mind that I've shared, and I've got an agreement, I probably should go back to the COM and remind them of this, but one is somebody who actively works for um, pulling a congregation out of the denomination. We don't want to deal with that. We don't want that member in this presbytery. Secondly, um, is, you know, there's, there's been lots and lots and lots of talk in numerous, but no one will come forward to file an allegation of offense. So in a situation like that, and it, um, it, uh, that might be, you know, or I can always go back to the COM and say, you know, here's what I found out. And we don't really want the PNC to know all the details because then the PNC, and we had this happen in our presbytery before I came, PNC then tells the pat or you know what another PNC told the pastor and um, the pastor got mad at their EP and we don't want that to happen. Yeah. So, so it's it's go ahead. Oh, I, mean, I was going to say to add to that, what's your recommendation to COMs uh, to recommend to the churches about social media searching and stalking? <laughs> That has been used and abused. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, it's not. Um, there's nothing wrong with you looking at what's out there on social media. It's because it's public. But there's a difference between information and, like Olivia said, stalking or you know asking to friend them on Facebook so that you can look at their Facebook page. No, 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 no. Um, but um, if you if you do find some things that are um, concerning um, or a congregation does, they should um, have that conversation with with COM, with the liaison with um, and talk about whether this is a, a deal breaker or can. And I will tell you, I, I have uh, I have been at a congregational meeting where a pastor was being called um, and some people had gotten online and took offense to something that she had said and got up at the congregational meeting and said horrible things about this person. And it was ugly. It was, yeah. Anyway, I, I said the church not at its finest. And so, yeah, that's a conversation you should have about yay or nay on that and what to do if they find anything difficult. All right. Um, okay, so let's then we're going to talk later about examinations that you're required to do. Um, and always when uh, you're having if you ever having conversation with candidates when you're doing the examination, you should really be honest about um, the congregation, the things you know, don't don't diss them, but you know, the plus and the minuses, um, but the things that um, um, that they may not hear from the co uh, the uh, congregation. Help your PNC and you yourself to be clear with candidates. It's you know if, if candidates are still being considered by the um, PNC, it's really not your place to tell um, somebody. Oh well, they've got a bet a first. Uh, they got somebody they're really more interested than you. That's really not your place uh, to say that. It's uh, but you're going to help the committee be clear with the candidates that they're considering. Um, where they are in the process, whether they're still being considered, whether they're not being considered, to give them the courtesy of letting people know that they're um, no longer being considered. Um, so be helped with that. There, there will be some bumps along the way. Sometimes um, you're, um, that you can't even anticipate um, when it uh, feels like uh, there's nobody to look at. I, I do remember somebody calling me up one time and said, we've read a hundred this, I'm sorry, this, I'm kind of mean, but um, we've read a hundred PIFs. There's not a good one in the bunch. And I said, so did you look at any of the women? And there was just dead silence. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's a conversation we need to have with your COM. Anyway, 
So there are some bumps that you may have to come along, especially if there's factions going on and they, they aren't going to be able to agree on anything. You're going to have to do some mediating in there to get back on track. I will tell you, there's also the thing of what I call the seeking Jesus. Jesus is always in the next batch of PIFs that are, is coming in. And um, no one seems to measure up well enough. They don't realize that they're looking for um, mere mortals. And um, uh, that's, that's also one of the ways they keep dragging on the process. Well, okay, we need, enough, we need, we need some more matches. We need some more matches. We need some more matches. We need to go. So um, help them um, not just looking for Jesus here. And then uh, there can be out and out conflict. You're going to have to deal with that. Um, if they get stuck, they just, you might have to kind of back the truck up, get it out of the mud, reevaluate. I know of a, uh, several PNCs that just had to stop just looking at PIFs and just started praying together and getting clarity again, and then getting back on track. And occasionally their choice says no. Um, the, the one that they've all fallen in love with and they would really like they say no that is actually i know it feels like the end of the world to the pnc um it it may not be the end of the world to the pnc that there may be somebody else that god has in mind because it remember it's a three-way call the person the congregation and the presbytery and if one of those three doesn't see it there then it's not a call so help them see that there there might be someone else and i've heard of PNCs who, who have said in their discouragement, they thought, oh, maybe we shouldn't even be on the PNC anymore, but we're able to get back up and running and actually said, we found, a, we found someone that probably was the best and the right for us. So help them see that. Um, negotiating terms of call. Oh, wait, did I miss? Yeah, okay. Um, we talked a little bit about that, um, just making sure that everybody is clear what those terms of call are. If your if your PNC says we've got to offer this person ten thousand dollars more than we had uh, worked out with the session, they're going to have to go back to the session and see if there's going to be money to do that. Got to have presbytery approval. No, remember, I'm going to quote it to you again. No pastoral relationship can be established, changed, or dissolved without the permission of the presbytery, the approval of the presbytery. And then you're going to install, them. and this is. The installation is a is a service of the presbytery. Just saying, so um, you don't leave it in the person's lap to plan it. You're going to help them plan it. I I just preached in an installation that took now some of it's COVID related that took place 13 months after the person came. A little anticlimactic in my opinion, but see see what you can do and help. And remember and remind that this is a God thing. This is a call thing. This is a spiritual thing. These things will happen in God's good time, which is, I, I'm, I admit, is not usually in my timeline. <laughs> I'm a little impatient. So, um, so, okay. So that's this. I, Gavin sent you a list of questions about uh, examination. Ex, no, examinations. We aren't there yet. Okay. No, uh, we we I didn't send it to him. We're, we're going to put it in the yeah. Don't no deep. Okay. So what we're going to do now? It's now um, twelve. I want to encourage you to go into your group for fifteen minutes, just fifteen minutes, to talk about um, what you've heard so far, how it relates to your particular Presbytery's COM work what's been helpful, what isn't, or, or clarification you might need about how your COM does something, um, just for about 15 minutes. So we'll plan that at 12.15. And uh, let me share my screen with y'all. You can see that, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so what is an examination? So it is not just a walk in the park. So tell me, what's your favorite color? Um, what toy did you like most when you were a child? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't some kind of softball questions that you wanna do to kind of get 
break the ice when you're heading into an examination, but you're not going to want to spend all your time on softball questions to, so that everybody feels good and warm and fuzzy. Um, but at the same time, it is not an inquisition. So, uh, you know, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or uh, how does Karl Barth's doctrine of the election differ from John Calvin's? Um, so some of you might want to ask that. Um, I wanted to mention the first one of the questions I got on my very first when I was ordained was describe giving the, ma the major events, characters, and details the Bible. Oh, my. Yes. <laughs> Yikers. Okay. It took, Not over, it took over half an hour just to get say, hit the highlights. That wasn't a semester-long class? Okay. After I did the Old Testament, they said that's good enough. <laughs> Oh, man. So um, the point of the examination isn't to try to trip somebody up, uh, to ask them gotcha questions, um, or to demonstrate how much smarter you are than they are, nor is it to make them um, feel good and warm and fuzzy about you all. And, and um, it, it, it really is to be used as a tool um, by the presbytery to help you find ready and faithful leaders who can lead the church to fruitful ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate purpose of the examination. So, um, the particular this means that, this means that um, councils have a responsibility to nurture, guide, and govern inquirers, candidates, ministers of word and sacrament, ruling elders, and deacons. Those who will be or who witness as part of the church. So um, the presbyteries will want to ensure that those who witness um, have the gifts and the skills, the faith and the understanding, the wisdom and the love to do that work. And this is directly from um, the, the book of order. Um, the presbytery is responsible for the government of the church throughout its district and for assisting and supporting the witness of congregations to the sovereign activity of God in the world so that all congregations become communities of faith, hope, love, and witness. And so in that responsibility, the presbytery will want to ensure that those churches have leaders who can help them become communities of faith, hope, love, and witness. Presbytery responsibility includes some of this we've co covered, establishing pastoral relationships, guiding the preparation of those um, be preparing to become teaching elders, the CPM portion, ordaining, receiving, installing teaching elders, and commissioning ruling elders to particular pastoral service. So it's clear that the presbytery has a responsibility for examinations in a variety of settings. So, so who examines exactly? So every presbytery, I think, does this differently. <laughs> it's not one size fits all. Um, so the old fashioned way is that the entire presbytery on the floor of presbytery does an examination of somebody coming into the presbytery, somebody coming forward for ordination. Um, now, I've been in those presbytery meetings. You've been in those presbytery meetings. I've been the, on the receiving end of those questions in those presbytery meetings. Um, but I've also been in presbytery meetings where one or two questions are asked for the, from the floor and then somebody moves that the examination be arrested. Now, I would kind of argue that if that was the only examination that this person was having to engage in when they came into the life of the presbytery, it wouldn't be very thorough. Um, and, um, and I actually was in a presbytery meeting where the only question that was asked was from the chair of the COM and then not one question was asked from the floor. So again, if it's just the entire Presbytery, I think Presbyteries have pretty much learned that, um, that that method of using the entire Presbytery isn't very effective. And then, um, so it's usually been handed off to the COM and for candidates to CPM. Um, 
And, but there is in some presbyteries an expectation that, that when they're doing examinations that the entire committee would be part of that examination. Nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, you know, just depends on how you do it. Um, and then there are presbyteries that have examination subcommittees or a small uh, group from COM that does um, that or even a broader committee for some, some people from CPM, some people from the committee uh, from the Presbytery at large who are particularly good at this kind of work um, who might make up a, a, um, a subcommittee of some kind. And then um, I do know Presbyteries that have combined their COM and CPM examinations into one high, uh, hybrid committee. It's like we they examine everybody who comes in, to, whether it's an inquirer or a candidate or whether it's somebody coming in for membership. And I suppose there are other compilations of that as well, other, other combinations of how the, the examinations get done. Um, so the question you have to ask is, you know, who, exa who examines in your presbytery and for what? So if it's for ordination, if it's for uh, somebody coming in to take a new call who's already an ordained minister, is it for a commissioned ruling elder who's uh, being commissioned? Um, who who in your presbytery is doing it and for um, and what? So who is examined? So obviously we we all remember that it's candidates for ministry. Um, everybody is aware of that when they're coming up for ordination. They they they've done everything. They've got a call. They're coming forward for ordination. Ministers who are accepting a new call within the presbytery, and, and it's and it's usually, uh, <coughs> I will say, um, it's usually ministers coming from another presbytery. Now that means you shouldn't get the people in your presbytery who are moving from one call to another call within the presbytery a pass on any sort of examination, because we're going to talk about what you're supposed to be examining for. Um, and that should still happen, even if it's just somebody's moving across town. Um, mem members at large who are new to the presbytery, who are coming into the presbytery. Now, um, I will tell you there are presbyteries that say we don't accept members at large into our presbytery, um, which that hard and fast rule has been discovered to be uh, probably a little not good if somebody has a trailing spouse. Um, you know, the, somebody's taken the you know head of staff at first friendly and they're also a minister but they don't yet have a call um there is something welcoming about receiving them as a member at large but when i was in the presbytery of santa fe i had a lot of people who come and say i feel called to live in santa fe <laughs> uh, we weren't real eager to take them in as member at large and then um and if you're one of those hot spots for honorably retired that want to come and live in the you know in the hills of South Carolina, um, and they want to transfer their membership to the Presbytery, you're, you're going to have to examine them too. HRs don't get a pass just because they're HRs, even though I will tell you, it seems like it. Uh, also remember, ministers transferring into the PCUSA, we talked about that this morning, those um, ministers who want to become PCUSA SA pastors, ministers um, from another congregation, another denomination serving a PCUSA congregation as a temporary pastor and new immigrant ministers from another denomination. Um, also ruling elders being considered for commissioning. Now, some presbyteries have different committees to deal with commission ruling elders. Some have, again, slopped over with maybe COM on some of that, especially because COM works with the congregations. Um, but you, you're as COM working with the congregations are going to want to make sure whether if you're not the entity, who is the entity, and you're going to want to know the outcome of that examination. And, um, and those persons who have been released from ordered ministry who want to be restored to order ministry, you're, you're going to be examining them. So <clears throat> why do we examine? So this, which which, if you think about it, why we examine is going to also frame um, maybe what some of your questions might be. Um, so first is discerning God's call. You know, the call to ordered ministry in the church is an act of the triune God. This call is evidenced by the movement of the Holy Spirit in the individual conscience. 
the approval of the community of God's people and the concurring judgment of the council and the church. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're discerning that this person is indeed called to serve in the capacity that um, in your presbytery that uh, they have been called to. So you're gonna be um, um, examining for suitability. Now this is this really talks about inquire, inquiry phase um, more than um, ministers, but you're you're wanting when you enter, when you are examining people who are coming into your presbytery, um, you want to know that they are suitable for the ministry of that church in this presbytery. So it's um, anyway. So this is what it says about inquirers. The purpose of the inquiry phase is to provide an opportunity for the church and those who believe themselves called to order ministry is teaching elders to explore that call together so that the presbytery can make an informed decision about the inquirer's suitability for ordered ministry. You can replace inquirer with the, the candidate being considered for a call, even if they're ordained, and the suitability for the ordered ministry in this particular time and place. Um, for fitness and readiness, especially if you've um, maybe heard from a reference check that there might be some issues, uh, uh, health issues or um, mental health issues or, you know, they're getting out of drug treatment. I mean, you know, so um, you're going to want to make sure that they're, they are ready to enter into the um, ministry that they've been called to wholeheartedly and they're, they are ready to do so. And then what we talked about is for ordination as well. You probably will not be a uh, part of that per se, but if you have first call um, candidates who are, and they're being called to a church in your presbytery, there's gonna be a conversation about where is the examination going to take place? Is it gonna take place in the presbytery of care or is it gonna take place in the presbytery of um, call for, for ordination? So which council is going to do that? That's gonna be a negotiated thing. However, you just because let's say just because they're being examined over at uh, that uh, John Calvin Presbytery, that doesn't mean you can't examine them. You are going to examine them because they're going to come and join you, and you may want to ask some hard questions, and you might want to know that they're ready for ministry. Um, so um, just they don't get a they don't get a pass. Sometimes it, they have ended up candidates have ended up being examined on two floors of presbytery. I'll tell you, and there's nothing wrong with that. So um, you're also going to um, examine for presbytery membership. You know the culture and place of your presbytery. You know the theological quirks, you know the, you know, where you stand on the spectrum, you know the church, you're, you know, you're going to want to say, is this person going to be um, a productive member of our presbytery and be a colleague to minister, our, the, the ministers that they're going to be in work, uh, working relationship with. So you're going to want to examine for presbytery membership for fit to that particular ministry. So does, is, does this feel like the right person for the right church? And again, if you're having doubts about this, it's better to have it earlier rather than later. But when you're in the midst of an examination and stuff comes out and you are clear, this is not right, you gotta be able to say no. There will, there will be fallout. There will be... Um, repairs that have to be made with the church and the pastor nominating committee. But um, you, again, it's, it's a situation that you don't want to have to deal with later. Um, so, um, okay. So when, when do you examine folks? Before it's too late. So, this is like before the, if you were looking at it from a CPM perspective. So it's before the inquirer has spent um, uh, three years in seminary and uh, racked up um, educational debt when you also knew pretty much first year that they probably weren't the best 
person for the to, to be in um, pastoral ministry. It's, uh, it's kind of the same with the candidate. Um, um, but don't move them to candidacy if there's questions. Um, so also before the congregation has voted on the call for a pastor, um, that's where you got to be working closely to know where the, you are with your pastor nominating committees. Um, you want to make sure that you've had your chance to examine them um, before it ever comes to the congregation for a vote. I maintain that if you let the congregation votes vote before you've examined them, you it, it's it's almost it's too late. Again, that's where people where where COI members start to say, well, I can't say no now. So, um, uh, also, I'm I'm discovering uh, several times. Um, it's really better to do this examination uh, before somebody comes on site and starts working. Uh, I, I, I can't believe how many Presbyterians say, well, you know, our COM is not meeting till next month, but you can come ahead. You can go ahead and come and, you know, start start your ministry there. And we'll get you, we'll get you after you've already gone on board as the interim pastor or the state of supply. Um, so sooner again, rather than later. Examinations are done at the convenience of the presbyteries examining committee. So don't get bullied into those last minute um, already done deal exams. Um, but also you don't wanna string people along either. So it's that, that balance that you, um, just because somebody has, is in a hot hurry to get somebody called to the position, um, don't, don't skimp or get bullied into um, trying to make it happen sooner than it really needs to, till you've got all your examiners and you know exactly what you're doing. I will also tell you that you are not obligated to, to examine every single person who wants to come and uh, meet with you. And I will tell, that's, that's some of that, um, those uh, folks who are in member at large committees, uh, a member at large membership who say that they'd like to come and be part of the presbytery, but there's no real uh, extenuating reason that you would want to bring them in. Um, you don't have to even meet with them. You say, no, we, you know, we don't generally let uh, members at large. We don't receive members at large. We prefer you keep your membership in your presbytery of membership. And if in fact, there's a call that comes up that you are being considered for, then, then we would entertain the possibility of examining you. Just because, and if somebody comes to you and just says, "I'm a, uh, I'm an American Baptist pastor, and I'm new to the area, and I want to be able to serve Presbyterian churches," so let's, you know, let's get examined. And you know, if you don't have a particular need, um, it doesn't mean that you know your Presbyterian staff couldn't have a conversation. But to make it more formal of an examination, you may not be in a position to do that right at that moment, or say, you know, maybe if there's an opening, and you know you seem like a bright fit, then we might have that conversation. So it's, it's okay to have a courtesy conversation, but don't bring it up to the level of full, full blown COM exam where the expectation is that you're gonna have a decision made at the end of that. Um, so let's have a little word about time. So how much time do you actually need for an exam? What's the minimum amount of time that you think you would have to do, let's say for a minister who's coming into the presbytery uh, from another presbytery, gonna serve a church. What would you say, good, good amount of time for an exam? Two hours? Robin's shaking her head no. I said an hour. An hour. It's I would tell you to block out, block out two. You may not need to, but block out two, just in case things are said that you're going to have to go. Whoa, we need to have a, we need to ask some more questions. Um, so just take the time you need. So if you encourage the examining committee or whoever's going to be doing it to to set aside that time, they won't be looking at their watch saying, "Well, I got to go pick up my kid from choir practice and." Um, to again, make sure you have enough time to ask all the questions you need to ask. It's better to have more time scheduled than it is um, to have to actually have to use it. Um, so, 
All right. Uh, let's see. So on what do you examine? This is where you're going to find good, good guidance in uh, chapter two um, of the uh, form of government. Um, you're going to be examining on gifts and qualifications. What is it that this person, this particular person brings into this particular ministry in the Church of Jesus Christ in, as expressed in the Presbyterian Church USA? Um, we have an expectation that God gives gifts, suitable gifts that can be used um, in those in the various ministries. And you're going to want to know what those are. Um, to those who are called to exercise special functions in the church, deacons, ruling elders, and teaching elders, God gives suitable gifts for their various duties. To those uh, who undertake particular ministries, um, those who undertake should be persons of strong faith, dedicated discipleship, love of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. How are you going to ascertain that? What are you going to ask to be able to get at the answers to those, to those questions? And their manner of life should be a demonstration of the Christian gospel in the church and the world. How are you going to get at that? What are you going to ask that you can get a sense of what that means, their manner of life? how they go about their daily living, how they um, engage with other people, how they engage with their Lord and Savior, all of that um, you're going to want to know. And um, to remind yourselves that standards for ordained service, we have standards. If you didn't know that, we do have standards that we expect of our ministers of word and sacrament, our commission ruling elders, um, reflect the church's desire to submit joyfully to the lordship of Jesus Christ in all aspects of life. So the examination shall include a determination of the candidate's ability and commitment to fulfill all requirements as expressed in the constitutional questions for ordination and installation. There's a lot of questions there. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot um, to um, get a sense of who this person is that they can answer all of those questions in the affirmative. I was at an installation once where somebody asked if um, the, the candidate, if they would <clears throat> be a friend of their, with their colleagues in ministry, at which point she laughed and said, well, I'll try. I'll give this moderator credit. He said, this is very serious business. And if you can't answer that in the affirmative, and I thought, ooh, snap girl. Mm. And she said, oh yeah, yes, yes, I, yes. But how do you get, how do you get what, you know, what's the unpacking of that? What does that mean? What does that mean? You know, how does she feel about her colleagues? Um, they, the Presbytery shall, see these are shalls. I just want to remind you, they're shalls. Examine each teaching elder or candidate who teach, seeks membership in it on his or her Christian faith and views in theology, the sacraments, and the government of this church. Can you do that in an hour? Yeah. And councils may not restate, augment, diminish or define ordination standards. So you can't say, well, <clears throat> the Presbytery of New Harmony also requires that when you uh, are serving the sacraments that you must wear a um, white stole. I, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't add that stuff um, to what you expect of, of candidates coming into your Presbytery. You're also gonna to have to make a determination about whether this ministry is validated. Now, especially for those who are not in congregations, we usually get people who are coming to serve congregations kind of a pass. But in examining folks who are um, usually in ministries outside of the context of a congregation, 
you're going to have to determine whether a particular work may be helpful to the church in, mi in mission and is a call to validated ministry requiring ordination as a teaching elder. Is there an expectation that if you are the dog catcher for your county, can um, is this really actually going to be helpful work to the church and it, does it fit into our mission? Um, you're, you're going to have to determine whether or not this meets the requirements for validated ministry. And again, we've talked a little bit about the, the, this demonstrates conformity to the mission of God's people and the world is set forth in scripture and confessions and book of order, serve to aid others, give evidence of the theologically um, informed fidelity to God's word, be carried out in accountability to, um, in character and conduct to the presbytery in addition to any other organizations, and includes responsible participation in the deliberations, worship, and work of the presbytery and in the life of the congregation of this church or a church in correspondence with the PCUSA. Well, I know that many um, exec to exec checks, presbytery to presbytery checks, um, many times the question is asked, ask, did this person participate in, in the life of the presbytery? Um, and, and I have heard people say, no, we hardly ever saw them. Came, might, might have come to a presbytery once a year, never served on a committee, um, you know, I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not sure I want that person in my presbytery. So those are the things you're gonna to have to um, examine on. So how do you examine? Um, so in matters relating to preparation for ministry, the individual is subject to the oversight of the presbytery within the context of their covenant relationship. The ordaining installing body conducts its examination reasonably, responsibly, prayerfully, and deliberately in deciding to ordain a candidate for church office. I would say the same thing about installing somebody. I would say the same thing about approving somebody's call who's coming in to serve in a uh, temporary pastoral relationship. You're going to do it responsibly, reasonably, prayerfully, and deliberately in deciding. You're not going to do it haphazard, thrown together. Well, let's let's just find a couple of people and ask them a couple of questions. Um, the council responsible for ordination and or installation shall examine each candidate's calling, gifts, preparation, and suitability for the responsibilities of ordered ministry. Um, and the examination shall include, now this is where you start to get to the content, content, but not be limited to a determination of the candidate's ability and commitment to fulfill all the requirements as expressed in the constitutional questions for ordination and installation. Council shall be guided by scripture and the confessions in applying standards to the individual candidates. Um, how many of you actually have like paperwork that you expect past, uh, pastors coming in fill out besides a PIF? Anybody? Yeah, some of your presbyteries have that. So that it's more information that can be a, a starting point for a committee on ministry to actually have an examination. And it's easy when you have um, the, the forms that we make inquirers and um, candidates fill out. Um, we don't often ask for that. Uh, some, some presbyteries actually might be asking, oh, we would like to see your transcripts from seminary. Some might actually will say, we'd like to see your ordination exams. Um, um, you should be asking for every, every single one of the statements of faith. This is a great place to start the theological conversation about what, what they think, what they believe, and how that gets played out in their ministry. You're also going to want to make sure you have their PIF or resume or whatever it is that they have. Um, if, you've, if at all possible, the the responses from references, hopefully in written form that you can refer to, um, the MIF for the ministry setting uh, information, um, um, and certainly the report from the presbytery to presbytery check. Sometimes it's just as simple as there, you are free to consider them. 
Um, it might have more information than that about these are this person's skips, gifts and skills that I heard from um, the other presbytery leader. And um, there might also have some things that you require before you're willing to talk to them, um, which might include, uh, here's our sexual misconduct policy. Um, we expect you to sign this before um, we'll sit down and talk to you. Um, and if you have any sort of examination policy about how, what you're, what, how you go about doing an examination, you should make sure you have that and know what that is. Um, so you're going to gather all that information before you meet with the person. It's just like going to a Presbytery meeting. If you've read your packet ahead of time, it makes it a lot much easier to do than trying to read it while you're having the meeting going on at the same time. So you're going to need to read all these, this material, read, mark, inwardly digest this, and to know your policies and procedures um, about the presbytery ahead of time. So make sure you do your homework. And then along with the other people that you're going to be doing this examination with, let's all be clear about why you're examining, um, how the examination is going to be done, who's going to start, how many questions, how much time, um, how are, um, what are we going to do if something comes up, um, and what are some of the particular issues based on what I've already seen that I feel like I need to, I would like addressed um, so that you're all um, on the same page. And then what particular questions um, you all, you yourself, and then you all as a committee are, are gonna wanna ask. I know that some presbyteries actually have uh, lists of questions that they um, suggest and nothing wrong with those, especially if they can help get you to um, the information that you need. It's, it's really uh, can be very helpful. So you're not having to just stuff come out of the blue, but you certainly, as you're going through the examination, if something arises and you have a question because you either don't understand or it seems like, whoa, that's like wrong, um, don't let it slide. You need to make sure you ask the follow-up question or ask for questions of clarification so you think, so that you heard what you heard is correct. You need to bring to the examination an openness to listen for God's spirit as you discern together. Um, you're gonna bring your scripture and confessional foundations in your examination. You need to have some sort of knowledge base about that so that you can tell whether this person is deviated from like our reformed uh, understanding of scripture or, uh, um, or the confessions uh, and how you wanna engage those with this uh, conversation. You certainly will want a copy of ordination questions if uh, to come out of the context of um, being able to flesh those out. What is that, what, do, what does answering yes to those questions mean to this person as they go about their ministry? Um, and make sure you have all your needed materials together and your questions ready to go. Now, remember, you are not the only one asking questions. So if you came in with your list of 10 questions for an hour to a two hour interview, probably not. So it's, that's why preparation with your committee so that you have a sense of what's being asked so that you can get a broad um, uh, picture of who this person is um, theologically, um, scripturally, um, pastorally, all of that um, would be great. You are also going to want to practice some sense of hospitality. Again, as I said earlier, this isn't an inquisition. You're gonna make sure they have a cup of cold water so that they, when, they, when they've been answering, they're so tired, <laughs> they need to, um, to get their throat um, uh, cleaned up. And um, you also, if, if it's going longer than an hour, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that maybe you take a little break, a little bathroom break. Um, and I will, I will tell you, I was in uh, one examination where the person being examined got pretty hot and bothered. And the chair said, I think this might be a time when we might wanna take a little break. Um, let the person 
calm themselves down and then come back in and then they can debrief on a less volatile note uh, what's what was transpiring in the examination. So um, you're going to practice some sense of hospitality during that as well. Um, again, we talked about this sharing information because when you're done in the examination, it's always a, a, a great eye opener to let them ask you questions. What is it that they'd like to know about the presbytery? What they, would they like to know about the church? Um, what would they like to know about our processes? Whatever. And again, if we can say it over and over and over again, you've got to be able to say no. If you, but don't think of it in a negative way. Um, I want to remind you that the right of God's people to elect presbyters and deacons is inalienable. Therefore, no person can be placed in any ordered ministry in a congregation or council of the church except by election of that body. So as much as um, the session of a particular church says, you know, Jesus himself is presented to us, um, you, uh, you've got to have the three-way call, but at the same time, you can't, say, you can't say to the church, you have to take this other person because we think that's a better person. So um, they, they ultimately, in called and installed pastoral relationships, they, they get to elect who it is they're going to call. Hopefully, you can all be on the same page and feel good uh, about because the three-way call. Um, but um, you're not just going to let it slide. But you also, um, you can't just put somebody in there. And, you know, even if it's temporary pastor, uh, uh, um, you, that you can't just put anybody in there either. That's the session is going to vote on that person. So anyway. Um, okay. So that's it on examinations. Any questions, concerns? How many of you want to admit your presbytery does a great job with examinations? How many of you want to admit there's little room for improvement? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's take a break for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. okay. So back here, starting again at 141. Boy, you're precise. <laughs> uh, okay. thank you joyce yeah thank you yep so break uh a break until uh 141 
So Olivia, you're muted. Yes, sir. I don't think um, I haven't looked at my email lately, but uh, um, yes. Um, yeah, no, I, I uh, got a call from uh, Debbie. She's going to send us an email, but okay. um, she was wondering if she has to be in Florence, which um, the week before we're supposed to gather at my place for our May EP gathering. Okay. And um, so she's going to be asking if we could do that on Wednesday, May 18th. I mean, the thing is, it's right before um, our convocation. Right. But um, so I said we're available um, to do that, to host that. And uh, um, so she's yes. um, she's her meeting is like 10. And she's, you know, on the South Carolina um communities board and right. they're meeting at the Florence location. I think they meet different locations each okay. time they meet. And um, so they're there. It's like 10 to about one or two ish. So we could always start at two and then go. Is Danny on here? Is Danny, can you hear me? Um, so I don't know. Are you and Hoover available? Danny? Yeah, at, the, at this point, we're available. That'd be fine. Uh, so what what is that gap? And I wasn't listening to your yeah, conversation. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I, I I just realized you're in here too. Um, if if she was wondering if we could switch it to Wednesday, May 18th, the afternoon. You mean our meeting? So the yeah, we were all going to meet. Yeah, the South Carolina Five. We're going to meet in uh, Florence at our place, my place, on May twenty fourth, oh, Tuesday, May twenty fourth. Oh, okay. And and yeah. can we move it to Wednesday, May eighteenth? Uh, May eighteenth. Uh, yeah, that fits fine for me. Yeah, Haney's are good with that. Okay, and and um, uh, Danny, even though she might, we we've got our meeting to do. She could, uh, 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 Judy could come. Uh, Judy, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Are you recording? Are you recording? The recording has started. Um. Okay, we're on the home stretch. Um. I um. Th this probably won't take a really long time. I, I think what what how we're going to end is I think I would be it would be helpful for you to all go back to your um, uh, breakout groups just to check in with one another and then you can all depart when you're done and go your separate ways. All right. Does that sound OK? So we'll we'll end as a whole group after this next presentation. We'll have prayer and send you off to your um, presbytery uh, groups. All right. All right. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about dealing with conflict, stepping into the fray. Can let's share my screen. Um, so um, the reality is, is you need, you need to kind of know this because you may think you're just going uh, to a triennial visit, not triennial with a session, you're just going to have a little chat chat with the session and um, you step in it um, like, wow. Um, and that's happened to me more than once. I just, you know, surprised out of the blue. Um, so you need to be prepared. So we're going to talk about COM's responsibility in dealing with conflict. As we have mentioned earlier, um, the role of the Presbytery is to counsel with a session concerning reported difficulties within a congregation. And that is almost always given to you as COM, um, that when you get wind that something's not going right, or somebody calls the Presbytery office and says, well, our pastor has blah, 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 um, that it's usually dumped right in your lap. Um, also, you just also may be the first people who get a 
whiff that something's not right, something's not going right. And um, so um, you're gonna, you can't just ignore that. You gotta um, follow up with it. And that in that role as being the counselor uh, to, the, to the session concerning reported difficulties, there are things that you can do. You can advise the session as to appropriate actions to be taken to resolve the problems. For instance, let's say um, somebody calls you from the session and says, you know, we haven't had a financial statement from our treasurer for the past nine months. You know, oh, that's a, that's a problem. Sometimes that's the, the little wave of the flag letting you know that maybe embezzlement's going on, but um, not that any of your churches would ever do that. Um, but um, this is this is a way that you can help come in and um, advise them and let, let's let's um, let's get this up and running. Let's get the you know the bank statements and how how you can help them with that. You can also just offer to help as a mediator. Let's say there's conflict within the session or within the congregation. You could again come, you can come in and do it if you're skilled. If not, you can send send in the the cavalry and just say there you go. They know how to do this and they can help do that. And um, you, can, um, you can actually act to correct the difficulties if need be. Um, and um, which is usually not where you wanna start. You wanna help them um, resolve the, the problem themselves, but sometimes they are difficult enough that you may be required to act to correct the difficulties, which, um, and we're going to talk about the assumption of original jurisdiction, which is kind of, that's, you're bringing out the big stick then. Okay. Church conflict is actually a given. It's, a, well, not just church conflict, conflict in all of life is a given. It, it, it and, you know, it, it's inevitable. So conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. And um, so you are in a position to be able to, when there is conflict, to help ho hopefully help resolve nice, healthy conflict in a way that is um, for the furtherance of the peace, unity, and purity of the church. Um, and, and so that it doesn't um, escalate and become a major problem. So a healthy conflict really involves um, the ability of folks to agree, disagree openly and engage in creative conflict resolution. These are, these are folks, you know, that are, you know, the people in your churches, you know, are all over the map on politically and theologically and, you know, understanding of who, whose family and who's in and who's out. Um, and yet I managed to stay at, stay at table together and um, agree uh, to disagree, sort of. Um, so there are ways to continue to even have this healthy tension of conflict while still being in co community together, willing to stay in community together. Um, healthy conflict focuses on issues, not people. You know, you're a horrible human being is not usually the way to get about to uh, a nice healthy res resolution. Um, when just you focus on the issues and and not on um, individual personalities and the, is uh, the best way to go. Uh, focus on equitable solutions to the particular problem and uh, focus on seeking what God is calling the church to be and do. I would argue that there is tension in that statement alone. If you're going to focus on seeking uh, on seeking what God is calling the church to be and do, there is sometimes tension in that within the life of a congregation. Um, so uh, that doesn't mean you can't uh, come to a healthy resolution in the midst of that. Unhealthy con conflict, on the other hand, is when you're unable to disagree openly and engage in creative conflict resolution. Sometimes I refer to this as, uh, you know, the sniping at the coffee mingle, um, or the or the parking lot meetings that happen to so that you can talk about the other people and you know be mad and um, instead of dealing with it openly uh, and uh, in a good conflict resolution um, situation 
And in some instances, you, you know people, um, I know people who, when if church conflict gets bad, they just disappear. They are unwilling to stay in community. Um, and for some people, it's like it, 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 if things explode, um, it's I'm gonna I'm gonna take my marbles and I'm gonna go home. I'm not I'm not willing to stay at the table or stay in community um, to have these sometimes difficult conversations. Focusing on personalities rather than the issues. Um, focusing on winning or being right. Uh, rather than what is it that we as a community to be, should be doing together um, with focused on uh, what God ha would have us do um, and instead and of focusing on, you know, what what one or two people in the church want to happen when the whole church doesn't particularly um, agree with the, that direction as being what's best for the church. So one of your tasks is as, as you work with congregations and pastors in the midst of conflict is can you identify whether or not you see this as healthy conflict, normal healthy conflict still doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to help them, but it, it certainly is a better situation to help in than it is unhealthy conflict um, where you might need some um, more uh, skilled folks to come in and help with that unhealthy conflict. This is a... Uh, this is actually a research, Faith Communities Today, um, it was just F-A-C-T, which was, um, is a research place, and they said that, um, uh, they did a, a recent uh, survey, and they said 75% of congregations, 75% have experienced conflict in the past. I think you would all say, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. 60% of congregations have experienced conflict in the past five years. And 20% of congregations at any one time are experiencing conflict. So if you look at the number of churches that you have in your presbytery and say 20% of them right now are having conflict, do you know which ones? Do you know, do you know who's maybe heading that way? Or, or you aren't even aware of. Now, this is not just for PCUSI congregations. This is for all congregations oh, um, in the United States. So and I thought this, this was a statistic I thought was fascinating. So in 2012, and I know that's 10 years ago, um, $683 million was spent on church conflict and resolution. Yikers. I was surprised by that. Um, but if you know, but if you're in a position where <clears throat> you're having to, to find um, uh, mediators to work with you with your congregations, with your pastors, uh, that that costs money. If um, if it gets so bad that you're in court, you're in civil court, if it gets so bad that um, um, you're you uh, just are are stuck and and ministry isn't happening and people have stopped giving money to the church and um <clears throat> so there are <coughs> sorry got a little tickle in my throat so it it is conflict can be expensive for you as a presbytery for the congregation itself well and for the pastor let's talk about pastors who lose their calls in the midst of conflict um who find that they now uh, don't have a way to support their families, have to hurry, try to find another call. Um, so um, it, it can be expensive. So, so we don't, I don't want you to wait for conflict before uh, you come up with some sort of plan or some resources um, before you step in it. Um, so how many of your presbyteries actually have some sort of conflict response team or resolution team? Anybody? Ooh, no hands, no hands, okay. Um, We're putting one together. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, I'm in St. Augustine Presbytery and we do have one that, it, you know, now sometimes they're all dressed up, ready to go and we don't have any place to send them. But what we, but there is a comfort to know that we can say, oh yeah, this is bad enough. This is now yours. So, um, but you, if you do have a response 
team that's apart from COM, you certainly as COM are going to want to work closely with them so that you know what's going on so that you can make your decisions based upon the work that they're doing as well. So um, you must be prepared for the inevitable conflict that you are going to run across in, in your work with COM. So all COM members should have um, uh, some sort of training. So how to handle um, the explosions from stepped on landmines that you just had no idea that you just you walked into it. Um, what is it you're going to do at that moment? Um, you, I suggest that presbyteries do have trained teams who are ready to handle the higher levels of conflict. If it's not people from within your presbytery itself um, that you have trained up who, who bring those gifts and skills in particular, um, there are people you can hire. Again, it costs money, um, and you know who 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 those people are. Uh, but you you need um, folks if you're going to create your own, who are clear communicators, who are knowledgeable about family systems theory, and they have some training in conflict mediation. Um, and you all, as COM members, every single one of you need need to know. Who do I call if this just all implodes? Who, who's your first call if you're in the middle of a session meeting and it just falls apart? Um, so you need to, to, to help everybody understand um, who, who, the, who that person is going to be, as well as give them enough skills and uh, everybody on COM, give them enough skills and talents to not make it worse. When they, when they actually step into it. Um, an ounce of prevention is probably your best uh, uh, helper. Um, and that would mean, you know, that's why, that's why the triennial visits. If you're regularly visiting a session um, where that has no uh, agenda per se, other than to hear about the ministry together, to, uh, to support them, um, you can use those visits when there isn't conflict to create a climate of trust and to pick up maybe some early signs of conflict. If you have never been there in the past five years and all of a sudden you hear that, there, that things have imploded there, you could have possibly found that out three years ago before it got bad. So an ounce of prevention is very helpful. Um, B present and attentive at every step of pastoral transitions. This is the way, I mean, they're, they're grieving when somebody's leaving, they're excited about um, somebody new coming in, there's anxiety in the system because, well, who's coming next and what kind of person might that be? And that might not be the right person. So if you um, as COM can be there and present and attentive and every, every step along the way, um, can go a long way to help alleviate the tension that can cause the conflict. Um, you need to provide good pastoral care for ministers, um, commission ruling elders, and educators that you are talking to them regularly and that you know that they get the support um, from the presbytery that they need. Um, and you're going to be alert to times when congregations and pastors um, might be open to COM assistance, such as times um, of change. So if, let's say you, you've got a congregation that is doing a whole um, new revisioning process or a strategic plan or trying to figure out what they're doing with about this building that is too big for the current ministry they have, that you, th this would be a good time for you to help walk alongside them um, to uh, help them at, to, to uh, come out of this change in a more positive fashion. Um, and uh, you also want to make sure that you're going to help the church professionals. And, and that, you know, we, we know some churches have more than just a pastor, um, that, that the church professionals who are, who are leading our churches, who are presenting the gospel in our churches, that they have, are leading healthy and um, healthy lives uh, in, personally, that they're taking their days off, that they're taking their continuing education that they're um, 
if they're, if they're sick, that you know about that and what, what kind of support can you provide for them? Um, so the ways in which you can help prevent ahead of time that, uh, are some avenues to get in there. But then you also need to have the pound of cure, an ounce of prevention, but you also need to have the a pound of cure because even if you've done all these things, you can still have conflict um, that you'll have to intervene in. Um, so the best things you can do is um, intervene quickly and effectively. This is where if you have a response team that they can get in there, that would be um, great. Um, it's because you can, you can eat up a lot of time trying to find out who you're gonna send in. Um, you aren't gonna send anybody in there all on your own. You're gonna make sure that the committee as a whole, how, however it is you handle things is aware uh, of who's going in to deal with the conflict, what the conflict is and who's going in to deal with it, that, that, that they're all, that your the committee on ministry is in agreement about how they're gonna about do that. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I have at least two trained members of COM or the intervention team participate, two, meaning two is just better than one. Um, you're leaving one person out there is uh, not a good thing. It's always better to have two. Um, extra set of eyes, extra voice, extra, um, if, if you start to get sucked in, that person can help suck you back out. Um, so it's just always better to have two. And you really do have a responsibility to provide pastoral care to all parties. And that is part of uh, a, a nice way of saying, you're not there to pick sides. You're there to provide, um, uh, Though you you may be having to intervene and make some decisions that have to be made, but you're also going to be providing um, pastoral care to to people who are hurt by this process, who are hurt by the conflict, as well as people who hey we won. So um, you're going to remember, remember you're going to be providing that pastoral care. First and foremost, I think you all need to be aware of who your who you are. Know yourself. Um, and what your style is. I used to be a really good conflict avoider. I had, I had, to, I had to work to get over that. I was the kind that would like, oh yeah, no, that, no, that, that couldn't have been as bad as I thought. No, 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 no. Um, so, you know, what conflict? Um, and another one is the competing, you know, I win, you lose. I got to be right. I got to get this. I got to, I got to take care of this. I'm going to get this right. Um, the, the collaborator, oh, well, we can all work this out. And I would say that a lot of times, yes, you can all work this out, but there's sometimes you can't. So, um, anyway, ideally it'd be great, but if you can't, then what are you going to do? Um, compromising, um, well, okay. It's not, it's not ideal, but I guess, I guess this will have to do. I, are, is your COM going to be willing to settle for it? This is okay. I guess this is what we'll have to do. Or would, would your COM much prefer a little bit, bit healthier response? Um, and then uh, accommodating, peace at any price. Um, so if, you know, know yourself, what your natural response might be when you get into the midst of conflict. Um, and um, think about, what your um, normal reaction might be as you deal with conflict. And think about how that could impact your work with COM. I want you to also be very clear, if at all possible, about are there trigger situations that your COM moderator might need, need to be made aware of. Please do not send me to a congregation where the pastor is now on dis. Um, has discipline allegations filed against them for sexual misconduct or um, physical abuse, anger, anger management issues. If there are triggers um, that you are aware of yourself, um, I, I encourage you to make sure that that is known to your uh, COM moderator. You can always say, I would prefer not to do that. I, it's not, I, that particular situation. It's not my, not my skill set. Okay, so hopefully you all know yourself pretty well. 
Um, one of the other things is to remind you to get, uh, don't get caught up in the conflict. Um, this is, uh, Gil Rendell loves this image of, which is get off uh, of the dance floor and get up into the balcony. So um, while COM is indeed a partner with congregations and ministers in the mission and ministry of the presbytery, um, but you aren't to be caught up into, into that conflict. Um, it's why it's important for you to be aware of how you handle conflict and how your button, buttons get pushed. Um, so uh, oftentimes when we're in the midst of conflict, and if we're in the middle of the dance floor, all we can see is just what's going on right around us. But if you can get off the dance floor, this is where the other COM members can be very helpful for you. You can get a broader um, viewpoint of what's going on, um, where you can say, um, you, you can get out of the middle of it and just say, let's see who all the parties are that are in this conflict. Um, the silent folks over here that we aren't even aware of because they're just not saying anything. So um, try, try not to get sucked into to being right smack dab in the middle of things. And then um, you need to lower the heat, especially um, when you get in a meeting where it starts to get uh, ugly. Um, you need to speak calmly. You need to ask others to do the same. You need to ask people to sit down if they get up and are. Um, you need to ask people to stop any name calling. And if you need to, you might also need to take a break. You need to say, okay, things are a little heated right now. I think it'd be helpful if we took a 10 minute break and everybody had a little time to, um, calm down and then we'll come back and we'll start over again. Now, this is assuming you actually have control of the meeting. Good luck on that if the moderator's part of the conflict. Um, and this, this may be where you might have to ask the moderator if, if you are uh, comfortable or competent and in, 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 the, in the middle of it, you might have to either coach the moderator or you might have to say, would it be helpful for you if I took over as moderator? If if you could do that at your request. Um, be, be careful about doing that, but um, that might, uh, you might need to help, especially if the, especially if the moderator's in the middle of it. Um, try to avoid typical responses that often are well-meaning, but not helpful. Uh, advising, well, why don't you just all do X, Y, Z, um, judging. Now that was not very helpful, what you just said. Uh, analyzing too quickly. The real problem you have here is um, questioning. This is one I sometimes use. Why did you do that? <laughs> and then um, overly, I, I, supporting is good. But overly supporting is, it'll all work out. It, it, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. Um, we need to engage in listening as a spiritual discipline. So you have to be open and uh, present to the Holy Spirit and our brothers and sisters in Christ, even in the midst of conflict. Um, try to withhold our judging or evaluating uh, in, until we get the full uh, picture of what's going on um, and have engaged the community, which includes the Committee on Ministry, um, in what's going on, to try all of us to try to truly understand what the issues are. And sometimes this takes a little work and digging and history um, that some of us may not even know and to be able to present the views of the other better than they themselves could present themselves. So that you've heard somebody well enough that you can say uh, what, you know, the, the, the typical, what I hear you saying is, but you know, that this is, this is, I, so that they understand that you've understood what has been going on. Remember that you are not alone in this conflict. This does, 
this solving this conflict does not rest upon the shoulders of one of you, just one of you. It, it, you have an entire committee on ministry. You have presbytery staff. You have other um, resource folks. Um, you've got your committee on ministry moderator. You've got your stated clerks. You've got um, a response team. You, you have um, people that if you've stepped in the middle of it, there's no expectation that you're going to fix that problem in the 30 minutes that you're in this session meeting, that, um, that you're just uh, one of a, a team of people who are really going to be dealing with this conflict. Then hopefully the conflict gets resolved in some way in a healthy fashion. Um, take the time, oopsie, to evaluate what went on. Um, were there some warning signs? Did we, if we had paid attention, did we, did we see this? Could we have seen this coming? Um, when did we get involved? Could it have been sooner? And when? When might it have been more effective for the Committee on Ministry to get involved in this conflict? What worked well and what didn't? We learned from what did not work well. So you've got to be able to name it. Um, and then just the, what have we learned from this conflict situation? What's the, what's the big takeaway that we have? Um, from this situation? And are there changes that need to be made on how COM deals with conflict? That, that's part of the learning um, and the evaluating. And then what follow-up attention or care is needed? Because you may have resolved the conflict, but, and you may feel like you want to go, phew, that's over, thank God. But that there is going to, there should be to, in order to maintain that sense of um, moving into healthier conflict resolution to, to keep the follow-up care so that there's no relapse per se. All right, dumpster fire, beyond normal conflict. Let's talk about a couple of situations. <clears throat> Ministerial misconduct. So, Misconduct is behavior that is unethical or damaging to the ministry and the congregation. This can include a whole bunch of stuff. This is not an only used list. Sexual misconduct, um, which by the way, our book of order is uh, has a very broad definition of sexual misconduct, which um, which is the which is the number four on there, which is the misuse of position um, in terms of sexual misconduct. So, or, you know, drug and alcohol abuse, um, want to get people the help that they need, but oftentimes by the time that has been found in the life of the congregation, there's damage that is already being done. And um, so you're going to have to uh, work with that. Um, the misuse or misappropriation of church funds, um, embezzlement, um, yeah, out and out stealing. Um, and then the misuse of power uh, role or position. Um, so your responsibilities in this misconduct is to be familiar um, with the presbytery sexual misconduct and uh, procedures and the standards for ethical conduct that we expect of ministers. Get help, advice, and consultation. Um, COM uh, needs to talk with um, presbytery, uh, your presbytery leaders, your clerks, um, if you need additional help legally um, to do that. Um, you're going to refer for legal and or discipline action when it is needed. Um, if, if it's a clear um, disciplinary matter, you you can, uh, it's, it's, presbyteries have gotten in, um, in further trouble by just saying, well, we're going to handle this pastorally. And then um, that uh, problem re rears its head again. And um, 
those down the line may feel like the presbytery um, didn't fulfill their responsibility. So um, you need to pay very careful attention about when you need to make sure that um, discipline allegations are filed. Um, please know that dealing with misconduct is often outside the work of COM, especially when the rules of discipline come in. Um, oftentimes your presbytery leader leaders will be the ones that were or might be dealing with the pastor most directly. Um, and, um, and that doesn't mean that you are not concerned about the congregation because you're going to, if this, if this explodes, you're going to have to continue to provide cat pastoral care to that congregation, make sure that pastor has pastoral care and his or her family. I've seen enough families that have in the midst of this kind of mis pastoral uh, misconduct um, who have split and um, spouses and children who have been devastated and felt like the presbytery did nothing to support them or care for them. Not, not one of our shining moments. Um, and you need to have a process and a plan for terminations if they're needed. Um, I will remind you, all of you, that um, any member of this church engaged in ordered ministry, oh, that's ruling elders and teaching elders, that's you serving on COM, shall report to ecclesiastical and civil legal authorities knowledge of harm or the risk of harm related to the physical abuse, neglect, and or sexual molestation or abuse of a minor or an adult who lacks mental capacity when one, such information is gained outside of a confidential communication. Two, she or he is uh, not bound not bound by an obligation of privileged communication under the law. Or three, she or he reasonably believes that there is a risk of future physical harm or abuse. So I've, I also often get COMs that say, well, yeah, but the work of the, the COM is confidential. Yes. But you are not in confidential communication with the abuser. You are not their pastor. And I, and I encourage you, and I, and I actually tell this to presbytery leaders, um, be very clear when someone starts to tell you something to stop them and say, I want you to be very, I want you to understand, I'm here as your COM liaison, I'm here as your presbytery leader, I'm here as your stated clerk. Um, that I am not your pastor. And what you say to me is not privileged communication. As a former mental health counselor, I can tell you that even mental health counselors have to warn their clients that there are certain things that if they tell us, we still are bound to report. Exactly. If you believe there is a risk of future harm, you yes, must. Absolutely. Right. So just to be aware of that, if, if in doubt, consult with your moderator, with your presbytery leader, um, but you have, a, you have a constitutional, moral, spiritual obligation um, to report. So let's talk about pastoral dissolutions in the midst of this. Um, pastoral relations- Could, could I ask yeah. a quick question? Are, are, you, are you just reminding us that we learned that uh, someone's molested a child we need to tell the police. Is that? Yes. I'm, I'm boiling that down. Okay. I thought that's what you were saying. I, I got it. Well, Thank you. Yeah. And, well, and it could also be a threat to hurt somebody, to kill somebody, something like that. Right. And yes, it, that wasn't everything, but I, I just want to make sure I, yes. you were being expansive. I, okay. Thanks. Yes. And then it, it also includes our own um, disciplinary process. So um, yes, you are obligated to tell civil authorities. Yes. Yep, yep. Okay, so pastoral, remember, pastoral relationships are dissolved only by action of the presbytery. Um, so just, um, so a, a pastor requests, you know, the regular pastor requests just because they're going somewhere else. But in, if you have um, a pastor who wants out and the congregation doesn't concur, then the whole presbytery has a way you know, to listen to the congregation, but that doesn't, I'm not sure that happens very often. However, um, it does happen when a congregation requests 
uh, I see this happen more often, that they want to get rid of their pastor and they, for whatever reason, it could be this, it could be terrible misconduct. It could just be, we don't like the way he or she does whatever. Um, and they want, uh, they can, they can ask the presbytery to dissolve the pastoral relationship, assuming the congregation has voted to do so. Um, and the pastor has, who doesn't concur can um, negotiate that uh, and speak to that on the floor of presbytery. Um, and the presbytery um, uh, can't, if in the course of its work in um, looking into the difficulties of a congregation, it determines that um, the pastoral relationship needs to be dissolved, actually can do so. Um, the, the wording is, if it finds the church's mission under the word imperatively demands it. So you've got to have a good and sufficient reason to do that, um, but you can do it without the congregation's approval and without um, the pastor's approval. Um, now there's a whole there's a and the mid and the your presbytery leaders will tell you there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes in trying to help negotiate a non-confrontational way in which the pastoral relationship gets dissolved because that's when conflict often rears its head in a congregation. So, um, but just to understand that um, there is a way for you as a presbytery to dissolve a pastoral relationship that's kind of apart from the kind of the normal way in which a pastor leaves. Then there is the ability to assume original jurisdiction. So when a presbytery determines that the session cannot exercise its authority, that there's something so broken um, that um, it seems like the presbytery has to become the session uh, of a congregation, um, there are steps that have to be taken. There must be a thorough investigation of what the heck is going on and um, saying, um, this, is, this, is, this is bad, they aren't, they aren't meeting, they aren't, you know, they're fighting, they don't, people aren't showing up, whatever. The session has to uh, be given the opportunity to be heard now, I will tell you, I, I know of a situation where the session just said, well, if we don't show up <clears throat> to this uh, meeting with the presbytery, then they didn't hear from us and therefore they can't assume an original jurisdiction. That's not what this says. The session has to be given the opportunity to be heard. If they don't take advantage of the opportunity to be heard, you've made an effort and you can move on. The... Um, the presbytery may appoint an administrative commission with the full power of the session. And during that time, the session ceases to act as the session until the presbytery directs them otherwise. Now, I, you presbytery probably has um, rules about how, to, how the presbytery goes about assuming original jurisdiction. Um, it's, uh, better to have those rules in your pocket as opposed to, oh my gosh, we got to do it, um, but we have no way of knowing how to do it, and we have to call a presbytery meeting in order to do it. So um, it's always better to be a little more informed about how, um, how you can assume original jurisdiction. Um, yeah. So any, any questions about conflict, about uh, dissolving past a relationship about um, assuming original jurisdiction. Any any difficulties with that? Okay, um, I will uh, get these to Gavin. These um, PowerPoint project uh, uh, slides. Um, I may not do that today and I'm going on vacation starting tomorrow. So it may be a week or so. <laughs> okay. And um, that's, that's fine, Joyce. And um, I'll, um, I'll wait then just to let everybody know, I'll wait to send the link to this video. It takes for this length of video. I'm going to stop it actually right now. Um, uh, yes. Are you sure you want to stop?